Hi, this is Ella McChrystal and you are listening to The New Mind. Today's guest is Andy Osho, who is an actor and a writer. And you may know Andy from seeing her on the telly doing a stand-up comedy. Um, but right now, we are going to find out about how Andy got into this career and understand the story behind the career she has now. Welcome, Andy. Thank you. Tell me, Andy, a bit about this sort of, as I said to you off camera, being an actor or a writer is not the standard career choice for mm. most people. There's a lot of people out there that are doing it, mm -hmm. but most of us are in what would be considered to be more normal jobs. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm kind of interested in finding out how you landed here mm. and then the journey that you've had to become who you are today. Mm. So if we start at the conditioning, mm -hmm. um, because I'd imagine like most of us who are over the age of 40, mm -hmm. there was always the line of the security, the job, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. especially at school. Mm. You know, if you didn't pass your GCSEs or your A-levels, you were going to be homeless. That was always the message that <laughs> <Yeah>. was received. <laughs> right. yeah. So yeah. for you to end up in a creative forum yeah. means that you broke the standard, I guess. Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, I... I... I wasn't thinking about it in that way. And actually, I didn't really do that until I was approaching 30. So where it started for me, I mean, like at school, I remember so clearly being at primary school and really wanting wanting to be in the school plays and wanting to sing and I was learning instruments. And so any way of being creative, I was I was sort of grabbing at it. But in terms of like doing it as a career, it just was not something I thought was possible. Wow. I didn't even think this is impossible for me. I, it was just an assumption. Yes. So I got, so I did uh, drama, well, theatre studies, um, uh, media studies and film studies. I told somebody that once. They went, was that one A-level? <laughs> it sounds like such nonsense, like to study those three. But they were three different A-levels. And... I, you know, because I was still thinking, I, I love the, the arts and creativity, even though I'm still not thinking it's a career. So it's just for enjoyment at that point. I, I, you know, to be honest with you, I'm not sure what my plan was, because when it came to the end of that period of study, so we're approaching 18 now, make, a lot of peers who were in an adjacent course. So like I've talked about this before, that people like Idris Elba and stuff like that, they were studying a more practical course um, that the ran same in time. tandem, yeah, yeah, that ran beside the one that I was doing. And so you saw people like, well, he didn't go to drama school, but some of his peers did. And so I saw all these guys that we kind of knew and were hanging out with, yeah. even though they were on a different course, all going off to drama school. And I remember having the thought, well, I'm not going to be able to do that. So, uh, and then I ended up going to a place called Ravensbourne, which is more of a like um, a design school. So it teaches people. Uh, what, so it's got a, design, a 3D design, a fashion school. So Stella McCartney went to their fashion school. So it's, it's, wow. it's sort of like create, it's like you're not in the spotlight. You're not going to be in the spotlight from going yeah. to Ravensbourne, but you'll learn how to be behind the scenes. Yeah. You know what I mean, and so they have a TV, they had a TV school there. So I applied to go to the TV school and I got in. So while some of those guys that I've been studying alongside, they had got all gone off to drama school and they were making it real, like making that dream real, I learned how to make tv programs that's so interesting so why did you not believe that you could do what they were doing or why did it not occur to you to do that what they were doing i think the belief system i had at that time was that you get something that's secure like yes. you get a good solid job and the i mean i can't even say that i had the thought oh no acting's not a secure job it just was not on my radar to to follow those other guys it's like to, your compass was set in one direction it was set in get a job get job security yeah. get you know be be in an environment where you have uh you know you've got a regular income and you go to a place of work and you're nine to five you know what I mean? all yeah. of that that's what i had grown up into and it was I think mainly from the family home, but also probably you said previously like school and yeah. uh, maybe I've underestimated how much that would have influenced me as well. Yes. Because, you know, we're having careers advisors telling us all these things. About, what were you? Uh, 
What was your career's advisor? Sort of I remember you? it being pointless. I don't remember there being anything of value from it. It was like a tick box exercise. Yeah, yeah, really, you're right. Yeah. Just like, yes, you go work there. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, OK, thanks for your help. <laughs> and then just sort of go off and work there. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't remember getting any value from no. it. But probably because my mind was already made up. You were already there. It, that compass was set in that direction. I'm going to get a nine to five security. Yeah. But I, but you obviously knew you wanted to work in the area of creativity. Yes. Now, what I know now about myself that I didn't know then was that it was never going to be that was never going to satisfy me. Yeah. So on this course where my peers, it's a very difficult course to get into, and I didn't know that, but I got on it. And but my peers really appreciated being on the course and they really wanted to work behind the scenes. What I didn't know about myself is that I didn't really. Yes. So I was, and I was also 18 and quite lazy. Yeah. So I yeah. sort of squandered this opportunity. <laughs> um, but when, but also whenever there was an opportunity to be in front of the camera, I'd be, oh, I'll do it. I'll, I'll be your presenter. Oh, I'll do it. Wow. And I didn't join the dots to realise, oh, this is probably because you don't really want to be doing this. You don't really want to be an editor or a sound designer or a whatever, or a director. Or blah. You just weren't consciously aware of the things that you were like loving yeah, and the things that you were doing. They were just, you weren't joining the dots. You weren't making those decisions. I, did, I, hadn't give, I didn't give myself permission at all to go for what I really wanted. I, I went for what I felt I should and what would be safe it was a sort of a a, a safe calculated risk because it's still a risk sort of going in, into that environment it's a bit more secure than than the tv industry is now now I think it is very difficult yes but, but back then you, you pretty much could could you know you probably could get a job and I did you know straight afterwards I was you know I worked in a, a post-production house um that had a technical job kind of sucked at it nearly got fired um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that but there was a lot so I did a lot of you know jobs in uh you know post-production and technical yeah. behind the scenes and operational stuff and then when you're doing that does it occur to you yet that there's more to me than this not at all I have no consciousness. It's so, you know, talking about it now, I realise like how unaware of myself I was yeah. during that time. It almost feels like a different life. I had no idea. I would, so eventually I got out of the technical roles because I just wasn't, I was too slapdash yeah. for for that. And so I ended up in an operational role. I was too slapdash for that as well, to be honest, but <laughs> you can hide that. <laughs> it's less, less, less impact in, yeah, yeah, in, yeah. In, in, the, in, that, in an office than if you're actually dealing with people's like physical, the media of, of people's projects. But um, yeah, I, I was just, not, I was very like into the nine to five. I went out pretty much every night with either friends or work colleagues and the weekends, partying all the time. And then I remember getting to about 27 and having, like, it's almost like coming up for air, just thinking, hmm, I've got nothing to show for my life. Boom, back down into parties. So that was and, the first thing yeah, that you... Yeah, I, I reckon I was probably, like, mid-20s before I really, even just a glimpse of having any self-awareness. I want, so is that is that because you were always hearing messages about yourself, so you had accepted those messages... Um, I, hmm, that's interesting. I think I was just in survival mode yeah. from my experience of childhood. Yeah. Not to say that my childhood, I think I had, uh, cause I was thinking about this earlier that I think I might've had some sort of trauma response to yes. non-traumatic like events. Do you know what I mean? Because it's how you, that's how you consider trauma though. Yeah. I mean, I, cause nothing traumatic happened. I mean, my dad did leave the family home. That Which was... would be considered trauma okay, now. Okay, all right. So maybe there is some trauma. <laughs> now, now you put it like that. Um, <laughs> I'm so sorry to be so blunt. <laughs> yeah. No, I no, I, I can see I can see that. I mean, I definitely had a strong reaction to... Uh, and, and, and went into a sort of survival mode. Yeah. Built up lots of survival techniques. And I think that they were just so... I was so masked by them or, or behind them or whatever that that's who was living my life yes so there wasn't really because it was so thick and calcified there wasn't really any room to um have self-awareness yeah 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 it yeah. was just so I, I was quite emotional quite a, no 
not emotional, like expressive, volatile, volatile. That's probably a better word to yeah. use. Yeah, well, expressive is like what polite. <laughs> if someone was being polite about she's how I was, expressive. yeah, she's she's just so expressive. <laughs> <laughs> the volatile is probably more like I was, you know, very emotional sometimes. Like especially if I'd had a drink and yeah. love the drama, trouble. You know what I mean? Like that type of stuff. So yeah, but you must have been that way because you were feeling chaotic, and you would have been feeling chaotic because something. So I always say about the trauma, it's not. The incident itself is the way it manifests for the person. Yeah. And that's all sorts of things, genetic makeup, environment, other experiences that add to the layers. Yeah, yeah. But also, there must have been a sense of feeling chaotic for you to be volatile. It wouldn't have just been you, I am a volatile person. Mm -hmm. It would have been, I am responding to the internal chaos. Yeah. I don't know if it's chaos. It was definitely like... Uh, I'm the, so the survival uh, sort of mode that I was in is I'm on my own I did this all by myself I don't need anyone else hyper independence yeah hi- hyper independence for sure and um, my mum because of who my dad was that put her in a survival mode yes and so where she had to uh, sort of make her way through that the trauma of what he did to her now that's trauma like what he did to her like there wasn't a lot of capacity for affection yeah and so that absence set a story off in me yeah that she doesn't love me and I'm not good enough if and and, and so I became one of those people that's like makes their value out of what they can do yes rather than who they are yeah so I was always trying to impress or achieve yeah and like would burn out yeah you know, at school when I wasn't being lazy I'd go the other way and yeah. burn out you know doing way too much involved in too many things um and that's that was a problem right up into my 30s of just not really not being able to manage myself and my time and you know self-care because you know, I, I guess I was still telling myself a story that if I just do this one thing, then, then I'll, I'll be, be enough. enough. Yeah, yeah, then I'll be enough. Then I'll yeah. be loved or whatever. So, yeah, so it was, it was, it chaos actually. Now, yeah, now I can feel, the, yeah, the chaos of it. I think yeah. that is a good word. Yeah. It, it was emotionally chaotic for sure. Yeah. And so, and obviously that spills out into like who I am in the workplace, my relationships with friends, my relationships, my intimate relationships. Um, how I see myself, you know, all that sort of stuff. So it was, yeah, it was, it was, it was troubling really, but I wasn't aware of it. I wasn't aware no. that I was like feeling. Because it was your things. norm. Yeah, it was this my is norm. The thing. Yeah, for sure. People don't identify it because it's all they've ever known. Yeah. It's only when you compare or somebody points something out to you, whether that be a therapist or a friend or a family member, and they go, you you know that you don't have to do all of this stuff to don't tell me what to do yeah <laughs> yeah that's what I want to do. yeah that's where the volatile bit comes yeah yeah out. exactly 100 percent. i remember having i was on tottenham court road so clearly i remember um at the top of the escalator just thinking about life again around this sort of 27 type age like as i had started to come above water briefly and just thinking hmm my life's actually okay mm. and all the things that are bothering me are to do with my mind like and then I went back down that was the moment yeah I I guess something something was was stirring yeah because I definitely did get onto the path but it was almost like stepping onto the path then coming off it again yeah. stepping on and coming off it took a while before I really got that I it would benefit me to be on that path of just learning who I am starting to um let go of some of those survival mm. techniques or you know I don't know what you call them, strategies or whatever yeah. that I sort of came up with but that it definitely around that age I, I would have these moments of clarity we're just like oh well, hang on I'm okay and then go back into this <laughs> chaos and this sort of... so it was like little um I wonder if that's to do with that prefrontal cortex thing, because there is where we do rational thinking mm, and logic. Mm. And I'm wondering if, because it's supposed to develop by about 21, but I think some people are a bit later, oh. particularly if there's childhood abandonment or trauma. 
because it does affect executive function. Our, our brain adapts slightly differently That's around so abandonment and trauma. Right. And so I'm wondering if you'd got to about 25 and then the following years are about so the estimation would be around 35, everything is now programmed. Uh-huh. Although we know with neuroplasticity that's not strictly true because uh-huh. we can continue to basically mould our brain how we want to. Yeah. But we have to know the techniques to do that. Yes. But yeah. everything becomes slightly, uh, I guess automatic is a good word, uh-huh. by 35. Yeah. So those years between 25 and 35, uh-huh. you may start to have a little bit more self-awareness. Like, and that's yes. where that sounds about right. Because yeah, there was a I, oh yeah okay. So I was I was crying a lot. Yeah, <laughs> I remember I was crying. A lot. And um, <laughs> I don't know why I laughed at that. That's a horrible <laughs> no, thing to do. Like, <laughs> it was funny because I was crying a lot. But it was not. You see how people talk about being emotionally vulnerable? Yeah, is the, not the same as emo, like indulging those emotions. So yeah. what I was doing is, is indulging them because I wasn't expressing this stuff with the view to purging anything or yeah. moving on or getting some insight or it's just a release of energy i was looking for sympathy maybe yeah. or just to indulge the feeling i wasn't trying to grow but at some point i had a conversation with the then boyfriend and it was just like maybe try <laughs> <therapy."> <laughs> please don't tell me what to do no no i think i was probably i probably initiated it to be fair but like um, it took a while to get there. It really. Were you a- afraid? It wasn't that I was afraid. I I can't relate to this so much now because it's such a long time ago. But I did have the mindset of like, what am I going to talk about? Yes, which is common. Like what? what? <laughs> it's so common. People always think I don't know. They say when they start with me. I really don't know what to say. Yeah. And I'm like, well, let me talk at you and then yeah. you'll That just... might sort of yeah. throw something up for yeah. you and then, yeah, go from there. So um, I had a really interesting experience because I asked some, around some friends, I was like, anyone anyone know the therapist? Because I'm going to try and blah, blah, blah. And so my friend said, <laughs> she's like, I saw this woman. She was really cool. I was like, so I got a number and I set up my first session with her. I'm like, uh. <laughs> no, I didn't, I didn't. I, I, so I went in and her room and her, her vibe, I don't know. Mm. It was just sat down in her chair and she's got her tissues there. And I remember like just a nice comfy single seater and she's opposite. And she just like, when she gestured, she just like opened up her, ha- her, her hands and she was like, so? I just burst into tears, like just literally like, like waves and waves, but it was a release. This wasn't yeah. indulgent. This was like, even just thinking back to that moment, it just like my, got goosebumps Aww. just thinking of just like how important that moment was. Cause I'd never been given a context to look at myself in a way that, could have me see something new by the end of the conversation and someone who wanted to hear it yeah like that well, was someone like... who was skilled basically yeah you, you, you know we, we we talked about this before we started about what friends do and and, and it's I, I can't remember i was listening to a podcast that says they called it like dumb dumb uh compassion yeah in the sense of just like babes i get you and they side with you and it's just like that might not necessarily be, be what the person needs right now it's but this probably was, enabling it well yeah a little bit so this and th- but what she was doing is what this person in the podcast called wise compassion yeah she's like just a mirror up and giving you what you need rather than what you want and so she just i i, I must have cried for about 10 15 minutes yeah. like and her hands were just open just let me just let it just let me just do that and then we spoke. <laughs> so, after the, after a box of tissues. Yeah, and be- that's it. I didn't even know what that was because the way that I, my emotion, my most uh, sort of expressed emotion was probably anger. Yeah. Up until that point. Yeah. So this was very odd to me to find myself in this situation yeah. where it's crying, but it was a different type of crying. Was it because you'd made a decision that you were going to do this? Because this is, your consciousness is starting to get a bit more like, oh, there I am. Mm. I'll oh, go back down. Mm. Now, now here I am in front of the therapist that I've made the decision to be here, mm. and I know I'm going to do something. 
I, I can't say, but I would, I suspect that it was a, a having an experience of feeling felt. Yeah. Like really felt by yeah. somebody rather than indulged by somebody or somebody sympathizing. Yeah. Or poor you. Yeah. Which doesn't really, which wasn't what I needed, but she got me. Yeah. And she knew what I needed and she gave me the room mm. to, she partnered me in finding, mm. or at least at least walking a few steps along the way. Because once I felt better, I was like, girl, back. <laughs> <laughs> we are dead. <laughs> yeah, I did. And and she was like, um, I, I, I think you should, I think you should carry on. I think there's a bit more work to do. I'm like, babes, it's all right. Don't worry about it. Ah, and ah, I, yeah, ah, I bounced. Ah. Of course, two, three years later, I'm like, Stella, <laughs> are you free? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, so, yeah. So you and Stella did some work that mm. starts off a journey. Mm. Tell me about the journey that you had with Stella in the first space. You cry, you talk. Is there anything that you learn at that point in those first few sessions with Stella? Um, If I'm honest, I can't really remember like what we did but I just remember feeling better so there was some healing going on there was definitely some healing but she she had this um she invited me on a like retreat yeah and it was at a convent and Ooh. so yeah it was kind of weird because like this was quite triggering for some people because yeah. it was nuns running it of course or, or monks I can't remember I think maybe it was both and um or are they allowed to mix? It must have been one or the other. Yeah. But, <laughs> we'll check this. Yeah, we'll do a fact check <laughs> afterwards. But like, yeah, so, yeah, there was a bit of a religious connotation to it, which which didn't work for some of her clients. Um, but but actually, that that gave me a bit more of a, a room to see about, see he, the healing that was possible yeah, yeah, and yeah. Like start to become conscious of yourself. Yeah. But again, it was just like snatches of it. It was almost like looking through a flick book, just seeing yeah. little images, but not necessarily, you know, when you go through a flick book and everything moves. Yes. I didn't have that movement yet. It was still lots of blank pages in between and the blank pages were unconscious. Information. It was, it was... I suppose it was allowing myself to to break through something like whatever the I mean I suppose really what I'm thinking of is the moment that it really happened for me was like during the Concord work which I mean yeah. we've spoken about with um, Carly. Carly Ashdown who you had on um your your podcast before and for me that was the first time that I'd really you know been able to turn quick enough to be able to see myself yes you know because it yeah. creates a context where you can really see the mechanics of who you're being yes. in the world yeah and you're just like damn yeah I love that it's incredible and 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 so that's probably where I really was able to make that lateral step I'm now on a path of a journey of discovery yeah and I'm gonna err and fail and you know sink back into yes. the character or the story or whatever but uh, now I've got more of a north star yeah you know that's that. what that's what I got from it so what how did you get to Concord so to give context to Concord as well because it's like a it's a group thing isn't it Concord yeah so those are group conversations so it's basically I mean it's a sort of um uh yeah it's, a, it's an organization that does uh well-being yeah. work so that could be uh, on self-expression so that's the more um that's the, the sort of talking group yeah and then there's also but they're but they're sort of facilitator led so it's not just you know kind of people yes. in the circle just saying whatever's there it's more like facilitator led with a, a specific structure and they also do like food uh, you know uh, whole food cooking so teaching people uh, to feed themselves well and nourish themselves and then also body work so yeah loads of good stuff so lots of good stuff but yeah it came through a friend it's always through recommendation with them and so this <laughs> she said it'll just help you be more authentic and I was like the fuck are you talking about like, what, what does that even mean like be, I had no sense of what that it's so weird now because I I, I fully understand that and I think we talk more in society yeah, we about do. being authentic although I'm not sure that everyone agrees on what they mean when they say it that's a very good point very good point so but anyway she said it'll help you be more authentic and and she'd actually tried to invite me a few times and every time I'd be like okay babes and then totally like not go <laughs> <laughs> or I went to like a guest event and I was just like, these guys, no thanks. 
Um, <laughs> and then, and then you, you know, when something just lands and you're just like, all right, this, this, this makes, I, I, it doesn't even make sense. It just, I feel like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm just going to do this. And I, I remember I called up the woman who was like de- dealing with the new people who are registering for the program. I was like, listen, I'm not, I'm not even sure if I'm going to do the, the. <laughs> I was like, really like up myself and I was just like I just call into like you know just find out a little bit more about it <laughs> there's the hyper independence still in play that's it like you you can't get me <laughs> by the end I'm like okay and the deposit is how much <laughs> <laughs> and it was like three weeks away as well it was quite soon yeah um, and there's some well-being things that they need you to do that I wasn't doing but she she let me onto the program because she felt like I was I wanted to do it. Yeah, do you know I mean? yeah, like, she to, knew. Yeah, she knew that I was I was ready for it. Um, but yeah, it was um, that was a game changer. Really, it was really a difficult program because when you're really seeing yourself, mm-hmm. seeing what your humanity looks like, yeah, that's tough. Yeah, it can be very tough. Admitting to who you really are, who you really are. I think one of the biggest challenges, especially for anybody that's going on any kind of well being spiritual self-help whatever personal development path is really accepting who you are it's so difficult because if you don't like the parts that you see yeah because obviously we're, we've all we're not just one thing we've got lots of different parts yeah. and some of those parts are amazing mm. and then when you look at the others and you'll go oh my god i'm such a bitch yeah yeah and yeah. you have to deal with that you can't ignore it when no, you're doing exactly. the work i think that's so true and i think that it's an even bigger challenge for anybody going on that path because you might have romanticised the idea of what being on that path looks like. Yes. Like, I'm just so, like... <laughs> I'm just really in my, in my body. Right? <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not, anyone who says that, I'm not, like, necessarily saying that, like, you know what I mean? But, like, that can happen, can't it? And yeah. I've seen it so many times, like, I've been on courses and stuff like that where people are just like, I'm just like... I just, And you're just like, i tell you what you are. <laughs> <laughs> But <laughs> let me tell you about yeah, yourself. Yeah. Let me look, look at myself <laughs> and instead tell you about yourself. <laughs> but but what it is, what I've noticed is that because sometimes I used to think, oh, like when you say you when you declare you want something, why does the universe just try and fuck you over? Why does it yeah. just make it harder? And <laughs> yeah. then I realized they're not the universe is not trying to make it harder. It's trying to it's not testing you, it's helping you. Yeah. The only way that you improve in something is by getting stronger. The only way you get stronger yes. is by having challenges. Yeah. So when you say, I'm gonna try and drop fifteen pounds, the universe goes, Pizza <laughs> 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 you know what I mean? And ice cream. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Let me help you with that. It's not testing you, it's helping you build your results. Yeah, it's so true. So when you say, I'm going on a spiritual path, the Universe goes, let's say some pay shit. Yeah. <laughs> you want to be a bitch about somebody? <laughs> Look what she's wearing. And you're just like, oh, why are you challenging me like this? <laughs> so, so, so it's even harder if you declare yes. that you're going to go on that path. Yeah, 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 yeah. Everything. Well, I always say that, like, when you go to the gym and you want to build some muscle, mm. you are going to hurt. Mm. It is not going to come like, I lifted, I don't know, 20 kilograms. And there you go. Perfect muscle. <laughs> yeah, just do it the once. And boom. Yeah. <laughs> no pain. Yeah, nothing. Perfect but arms I... <laughs> look like Shirley Bassey <laughs> in your face. <laughs> and then the truth is, it hurts yeah. so much for about four days after just one gym visit, yeah. and it will continue to hurt. Anyone who's got a body that looks like a goddess or a god, yeah, yeah. they are in pain all the time. Thierry Henry says, like, if you want to be an elite athlete, you have to get used to pain. Yeah, you so have to true. learn to love pain. Yeah, you do. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I don't think I've ever loved pain, but I do get the premise of that, which is I know I'm not doing it if it's not painful. So yeah. That's not physically, that's both physically and emotionally. Yeah, yeah. If I'm not hurting, yeah. then there is no growth. Sometimes it is painful yeah. and... Um, uh, you know the avoidance of that can yes. m- mean that you're not you're cheating yourself with yeah. the growth yeah but it does it it is tough so when you go on a, a spiritual path or a, a you know personal development or you know any of that boy it's painful so so i suppose my point was was that it was hard looking looking at myself and seeing who i was being but then there's a freedom knowing that that's not all of who you are yeah. and giving that part of your whole being as yeah. appropriate context. So instead of it being a hundred percent of how you express yourself in the world, it now becomes, you know, whatever. 
so that something else is possible. Yes. Whatever that is, who knows, but like something else is possible. And you're, if you don't embrace that part, the, the bit that you're not keen on, you're yeah. rejecting yourself. So that's why people are scared of rejection because they've spent their lives rejecting those parts of themselves. Yeah. So actually what you're scared of is what you've done to yourself because yeah. you assume other people are going to do that too. Yeah. And actually when you show up authentically, which again, that word can be overused yeah. and un- misunderstood, yeah. people will just love you more because they know where they stand. Yes. They know where you, like if you're very assertive and bounded, yeah. then the people that respect that and love that are yes. going to be your fans. I forget that. I do forget that. But this is also why I'm a little bit sometimes not trusting of people who are like really nice. Yes. You know what I mean? Like really sickly super, sweet. Sickly yeah. sweet. Because I'm just like, you're really angry. Yeah. And you're suppressing really it. Asking it like yeah. really well. Some people are genuinely nice. And yeah. used to say if, if I'm really like assessing things correctly, but like I feel like, you know, the fear, I suppose, of being rejected for showing your not nice self. Yeah. Causes us to, to yeah. present in certain ways. I think to times. the point though where I actually, because I know I've got these darker spots within me, mm. I probably overshare them. Like, mm. this is who I am. Yeah. I'm really awful in these ways, but I've got some good qualities too. So yeah. will you accept me to understand? I don't know if it is oversharing. Sometimes, yeah. like, because it, it, that's where it, it, they get caked in shame, don't they? Yeah, they and so do. we sort of bury them. Yeah. And then we think, oh God, if people knew that about yeah. me, then I would be yeah. rejected. So we bury them. So I think, like, airing them dissipates their energy yeah, it does. a little bit so that you don't need to express from yeah. that, that place necessarily as much as you would do if it was being buried because the pressure creates energy it, it does it, it energizes it, it does it? And, and if and it also that that to that point with the body work side of things mm. that they do at concord if you're suppressing the anger mm. or suppressing the stuff that you don't want other people to see and it does create a cellular response an energetic response you're going to feel it in your body. You can have IBS, migraines, joint aches and pains because it. it causes inflammation. Yeah. It is acid yeah. and it will cause inflammation and you will feel fatigued. You'll feel all of these things where if you Google, I'm tired all the time, mm. you think blood tests will, I don't know, show that I've got a thyroid issue. It's usually sure. not. It's that you're exhausted and you're exhausted and in pain because you're suppressing who you really That's are. Yeah. You're so stressed. That's That really makes um, a lot of sense. Better out than in. Yes. <laughs> yes. Get it out. But it is like literally get that shit out because yeah. like, you, yeah, you, the the damage that you're doing yeah. to yourself by, by holding on to these things. I would say though that I think the art of, one of the arts of living is learning to do that in a responsible way because somebody could hear that and go, oh, if I tell everybody my shit, then, yeah, you know, blah blah blah, yeah. and then they do it in a way that doesn't work, and then it backfires. And yes, they go, it doesn't good work. Point. That's a very that's good why point. That's why I don't share. Yeah, you know? yeah, so it's got to be done in an appropriate way with people at the at the right time when it when it makes sense. Which is why the group stuff can be really powerful mm. because it's facilitated, like you say. Yeah, and you're with people that are there to do the same thing. There's going to be rules and boundaries with that. That's it. I mean, like they're very good at like setting the context for what yeah. the conversation is, and they're very and the boundaries as well. Yeah. So that you know, the temptation is as always when when groups of people are together to advise. Yeah. And so someone might share something, and somebody else will go, uh, "Have you haven't you tried blah blah blah?" It's like, yeah. no, no, that's not what we're doing here. Yeah. That's not what this is. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and yeah. so they'll wait until the break. <laughs> so yeah. All I was going to say, no. but um, yeah. So it, yeah, the, the context of 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 how people share yeah. in those those sort of group uh, facilitator led conversations means that it is a responsible way yeah. of saying where that darkness is and where yeah. it's been holding them back. Yeah, we're holding us us back as I've you know been in that same in those same conversations as well so this is this is where you're because again everything we've just said you're learning in this in with with concord yeah yeah and so still around 27 28 so i was like in my 30s when i did that but by the time i got there so in between i think i did like two more therapy sessions like um extended as i mean like yes. extended period one of which um involved me reconnecting with my dad because i was yeah just d- d- depression has been a, a, a issue for me mm-hmm. um between i would say sort of probably m- mid 20s to 40s i would say something like that and 
when you did this reconnection with your dad, mm. the depression just, again, for people that perhaps... People think they know what depression looks like mm. um, and they will have a version of it. Mm. But your depression this particular time was that you weren't getting out of bed. So that particular time, it was... Uh, okay, so the time when I couldn't get out of bed was actually... Uh, that was after I'd done a workshop. Oh, so that's and sorry, so that yes. was actually no. So I misremembered because we were talking about this before, and I and so that was after. So that was the most acute version of it yes. that I'd had. But this one, it sort of manifested, and this was still in my twenties, um, I think. And I, it manifested in I'd wake up, and there'd be this quiet for about ten seconds, and then this kind of dread would would descend yeah and it was sort of happening every day and one thing that I do remember is being able to distinguish this isn't feeling down Mm. this isn't feeling bad about something because when I feel bad about something I can talk about it oh yes god you know this is pissing me off or whatever yeah this was something that I felt like I had to mask so like an impending sense of doom doom yeah and so I would not tell anybody about it and so I would just like go through day to day, everything fine, pretending, you know, um, and then just want to go back to bed when, once I got home, you know, or drink. Yeah. And then um, same thing the next morning, that 10 seconds, five, 10 seconds of just like, everything's fine. And there it is come again. In again, yeah. So that that went on for a while. So that sounds definitely more chemical because it's like the brain, the neurotransmitters are not able to do their job properly. So, so I'm not saying it's not emotional because it's the emotional response that would perhaps create the neurotransmitter lack of or too much of. Mm-hmm. Um, but that feels like it's not a choice. Therefore, it's not just like you say, a low mood. It's mm-hmm. something maybe more, which can be corrected through doing the work. Mm-hmm. doesn't always have to be just medication, which is why it's an important point. Mm-hmm. You could have... Even what we were saying about inflammation a minute ago, like the the serotonin, which is the feel good mm. neurotransmitter, ninety percent of it's produced in the gut. Really? Yeah. Okay. So it goes down through the vagus nerve into the gut and back up again. Mm-hmm. So when it hits the gut, if you've got an acidic, inflamed gut, oh. or your microbiome's not great, right. you could destroy a lot of that serotonin. Oh. Oh, okay. And dopamine's the same. Well, apart from it's fifty percent with dopamine, which is reward and motivation, uh-huh. heavily involved with depression motivation. Right. And GABA, which is more of an anxiety-stabilising neurotransmitter, right. 35% of that is produced in the gut. So if we look at the gut health alone, wow. with inflammation, stress, not living an authentic life, oh masking gosh. all the time, you could see how the chemical response just won't... You just won't get the product back up. Well, I wasn't supporting myself in any way yeah. around gut health. Yeah. Because I was drinking heavily, yes. I smoked, did other stuff. Yeah. Um, didn't eat was completely unconscious about yeah. what I was eating yeah never gave it any thought of course well you don't tend to at that age you no. see the only thing the only thing I did is I went to the gym yeah and then because I went with people from work we go to the pub have a cigarette yeah, have a yeah, pint because yeah. look at us we just went to the gym <laughs> so now we're gonna just screw everything up on the inside <laughs> Like that. No, like, we we earned it. Of course, Otherwise, what happened? We yeah. earned the uh, pint, and it's ridiculous. It ridiculous. But that that could be a part of it, and I, I only say that for people that are like, "Why do I feel so depressed?" Yeah. Sometimes it's not. Some it is often emotional, and those behaviours are adaptive behaviours uh-huh. to chaos, right? Pain, yeah. Drinking, going to the gym, going out with our friends, so. It's not that the emotion wouldn't have affected all of that. Uh It's just that there's, it's so holistic. Yeah. It's so holistic. It's multifaceted. It's not just one thing. That totally makes sense. And I didn't, I was like, yeah, not not conscious, like I say, at at all and not helping myself in any way. Yeah. So, yeah. So you end up at this kind of impending sense of doom, but also I haven't really got permission or, or, or can I even... Can I even describe this feeling to somebody? Do I feel safe describing this feeling of doom? So I, I, I didn't even have those thoughts. It was just... I was just got, like, I'm not talking about this. Got to cover it I, up. I didn't even have that thought. Yeah. It I was automatic. I didn't talk about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so interesting. I don't want to, like, go too deep into that point, but we we assume 
when we are more knowledgeable, that people are making choices not to talk. They haven't even had the thought. Mm. It's just automatic. Yeah. So again, you've learned that somewhere along yeah. the line. Your when, whole life. I, I mean, given how emotional I can be, now, emotionally expressive, mm. should I say, now, like, or comfortable with expressing my emotions in a more, I hope, mature way. Like, it seems so odd to me that I was like that. Yeah. But I would either clam up and not talk to anybody or I'd be volatile. And when I did the first Concord thing, first Concord program, I hope I'm okay to, I don't think this is breaching confidentiality by saying this, but this one person shared a story where he was talking about just being given permission to be, basically, to, to dance. Yeah. And he just wanted to dance at this party and his... And his and um, uh, someone important in his life didn't want him to express himself that way. And he just said that what he really wanted was just to be able to have permission to dance. And that moved me so much. Yeah. But I was so, like, not used to feeling moved in that way. Yeah. You know, that being a way that I would express myself. But I just, I remember putting my head down, tears just falling onto my lap just didn't know what to do with this feeling wow like and and uh, this is awful like <laughs> crying wow amongst the, i remember i was in the back row so i just put my head down and they're very good at making sure you've got tissues so like suddenly there's a, a oh. hand <laughs> with a clutch of tissues I'm like, yeah all right thanks <laughs> you know like it was really a really strange experience like to uh, it's strange remembering that i used to be like that that's but, the power of, of sharing stories though yeah that's why it's so important yeah to share stories yeah i mean i wasn't thinking that at the time i was no. just more in my own mess yeah. of just like what the hell is happening yes why am i why? crying about <laughs> the kid dancing <laughs> but it just meant it was the permission thing yes. wasn't it yeah and also it was also hearing about somebody else's humanity and that's what I wanted I think yeah. it's just the freedom to yeah. just freedom to just be you know like I think I, I'd i felt that I did because I did feel that my mum was very critical I, mean, I say it like that really specifically like I felt like she was yes because obviously you create a story of all the times that she criticised me. Yeah. Because there wasn't that sort of necessary, uh, uh, because there wasn't that affection. Yes. It was easy to create a story of like, she, oh, she's just constantly criticising me. I'm never good enough. Everything I do is wrong. Yes. So I was, yeah, I think I just really wanted permission to just be. So I think that's why that story just landed with me in the way that it did. And at that point, you're in Concord when you hear that story. And you referenced earlier, just speaking about your mum there, is reminding me about your dad. Because mm-hmm. he had abandoned. Mm-hmm. And then you have your therapy and you, you're encouraged mm-hmm. to go on a journey of finding your dad again. Yeah. And you mentioned earlier, when before we started to record, that you were reading some books about the abandoned child mm, kind of thing. And mm. then you were seeing all of these, yep, yep, yep. And then other bits that didn't quite fit. Mm. Ignore them. <laughs> yeah, this is all who I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So tell me about finding your dad. Yeah, so um, another depress- another depressive period came up and I went to see the wonderful Stella again. And she said what you need <laughs> <laughs> and and it's interesting because it was it was it was kind of advice in a way but yeah. it wasn't advice yeah but she's like you need to reconnect with your dad that's what this this is all about yeah and I was like oh gosh I, I don't even know where he is you know I have no contact details for him she's like it's okay so we take it one step at a time do, who do you know that might be able to get his contact details so I was like oh, my cousin might well, like, <laughs> <laughs> you know some bratty response like ah oh, do I have to no I wasn't but like so I went I had dinner with my cousin and she connected with, with my half brother and in between all this I'm going back to the therapist it was kind of I was starting to enjoy it actually She's yeah like, I spoke to my cousin and she put me in touch with my half brother so I'm gonna meet him next week so I go and, and meet him and uh Never met him. I only met him once, like when we were kids. Wow. And that was interesting because he was he was born before my dad left. Right. Okay. And so at one so I'm meeting this kid and it's just like, How old is he? Oh no. Oh, okay. Do you know what I mean? Like and I was quite young at the time as well. So yeah. like piecing all this together, sort of trying to make sense of this. Anywho, so I met him, he had moved to the UK. So we met, we chatted. 
And I was like, and I don't know what, I can't remember why at the time it had to be like super casual, like not a big deal. Yes. But I was like, oh, I'm, you know, by the way, do you, do you happen to have like uh, a number for my dad? Like I just wouldn't mind giving him a call kind of thing. So he gave me his number and then um, I actually went back to therapy before I called my dad because it was weird. Like I'm quite an impulsive person usually. I'll, or at that time I was anyways. And I would usually just like, okay, I got the number. I, I, just wait, I'm just going to call it right now. <laughs> yeah. but, um, but I didn't. I left it a couple of weeks and spoke to Stella before I did it. And then eventually I did. And it's funny because um, I, I was I was actually sort of uh, volunteering on a Concord course and, and we were at this stately home and I'd, I'd, I got a break called me back I tried to call him and he called me back and it was one of those can you hear me now can you hear me now oh wait that's awkward yeah because yeah. we were way out in the countryside so we yeah so so the first time I've spoken to my dad in literally like 20 years it must have wow. been wow it was like can you hear me now <laughs> how about now wait I'm just gonna go up a hill <laughs> can you <laughs> and I thought this is perfect oh, this gosh. is just like you know what I mean like so that was um that was actually really good and I in that conversation, I felt something really interesting, like basically like a completing of a circuit in me. Yeah. I just felt, I just had this visceral feeling of just like, that was, that was, she, Stella was right. That was what I needed to do. Yeah. And so I kept talking to him. We carried on our conversations. I'd call him every sort of week or every couple of weeks. And the conversations were pretty much the same every time. Like I'd ask him how he was. He was always doing something really mundane, like the washing or something like that. And then he wouldn't ever ask about me really or my brothers. Or and I was, I was just like, I'm, just, I'm, I'm a bit bored of these conversations. Wow, like, I'm, yeah. I'm kind of getting bored of like speaking to him. And um, at the time, I was uh, working in a, um, I, I was, I was temping a lot, and so I was working on a reception desk. And I remember the security guard. I think he was Nigerian and I was telling him what had been going on and 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 that I sort of probably you know, that's not going to call my dad anymore and he's like oh, you know he's your father like you can't just so I was like fine so I carried on like having these conversations like for a few more weeks but it got to the point where I'd literally see like dad I was like, oh god do you know what I mean like your body was re- rejecting I just I, I just I just didn't want to I just didn't want to have these conversations that meant nothing yeah or felt like they meant nothing yeah because it's like, ask me about my mum. You know, I mean, ask how she is. Ask how my brothers are. Like, something. But it was just a really mundane and, to me, felt pointless conversation. Yeah. So I was just like, I'm not doing this anymore. And I had a real moment of clarity. It's just like, I don't owe this guy anything. He abandoned us. Yes. Because so- <laughs> like, you're trying to please him, I suppose, now. Well, that's it. I'm trying to do the right thing. And, yeah. and, and, you know, what seems to be the popular opinion is the right thing is to keep talking yes. to this guy. And so, you know, when I did that, I tried it, but I've got a low tolerance for for chit chat. Yes. You know. So uh and especially not with him. Yeah. You know, we're gonna we're we're gonna god damn it, we're gonna have a meaningful conversation. <laughs> or we're not talking at all. Um no, but as, so I, I just I just realized that actually the point of what Stella was having me do was not to start an ongoing relationship with him. It was it was literally what she said. It was to reconnect. Yes. And then that was done. Yes. And I mean, I probably, I mean, maybe there was a more, there was a way with more integrity of like deciding that we were going to part ways. I could have done that, I guess, in hindsight, but it was what it was. Yeah. I was who I was. And, um, you know, I realized that was, that was as far as that relationship was meant to go. And since then, you know, when I look back at, my relationship with my dad and who he was in our lives because of how we treated my mum I didn't really see it but she's now subsequently told us about it she's actually written a book oh you must have yeah and so I've learned a lot of the family history like from just reading her her book but I've realized that that was as far as he was meant meant to go with us yes and the when I really think about like, what would our lives have actually, because I, I deified him, you know what I mean? I put him on a pedestal. He was the guy yeah. and she was the meanie for like. Which is so common. Yes. Well, I heard, uh, you know, a previous guest of yours talking about exactly that same yeah. thing. The dad left. He's great. Mum stays behind yes. and actually picks up the pieces and she yeah. becomes the monster. Yeah. So that's exactly what had happened. Um, but I realised that, oh, what would, it, not that I can ever, you can ever know, but what would our lives have been? If he had stayed, yeah, would I have had the freedom 
to do the things that I've done in my life? Or would there be this, you know, paternal judgment of yeah. you should be doing this, you should be a nurse or blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So so I had this, in, in, again, in a, in a course room, just this real sort of clear vision of just me and my family walking across a field and then my dad sort of going off into the distance and then my mum turning around to me and where my heart is, there was a little door and she closes the door and then she locks it. It's like almost like the door of a cu- cuckoo clock or something yes. like that and she locks it. And for me, that just symbolised the veneer that I created for myself to protect my, or yeah, protect my heart because I perceived that it needed protection yes. from all the things that had happened. Yes. And That's profound. Yeah. So it was, it was, re- and it was a really helpful image, like just to know, oh, he went as far along the path with us as he was ever meant to go. Yeah. And that this, we were the ones that were meant to stay together as a yeah. unit. He wasn't, he wasn't meant to be part of it any longer. Yeah. Wow. So that really was what you got out of reconnecting with him. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't the connection. It's not in that. Yeah. 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 So you were able to emotion. make sense. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And that would be helpful to so many people who have had a dad or a parent, any parent, leave the family home. I think just yeah. hearing that bit is really, I've, I've not heard it said like that before. The, the way I see it is like, I mean, I was listening to something the other day talking about how, oh, you know, but they're your mom or your dad and unconditional, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Like, I don't think there's anyone we should love unconditionally. No, I don't like think you're right. Our kids or our yeah. parents or yeah. whatever. Because look, if somebody's being abusive, why are you still in yeah. that relationship? Or yeah. if they're not respecting you, I agree. if the relationship can't be transformed and, yeah. and the boundaries, boundaries set and respected then maybe they maybe it is right that yes. you're not in the in each other's lives even if it's just for a, a, a period of time I totally agree yeah. there's a great guy on Instagram who I follow and I'm sure we'll collaborate at some point called Josh Connolly mm-hmm. and he had toxic parent experiences mm-hmm. And he talks a lot about the toxic parents uh-huh. because society does say, but it's your mum yeah. or it's your dad. Yeah, yeah. I don't speak to either of my parents. Oh, really? And so I always felt like I should because they're my parents. Mm-hmm. And that was the narrative that was given to me. And, mm-hmm. and actually hearing other people talk about those elements, which is if someone is hurting you yeah. and they know that they're hurting you, yeah. why have you got to make that okay? Yeah. Like why have you got to fix that as yeah. the broken? If, if you like, you might feel broken. You might not feel broken, but uh-huh. you're the child, or you're the, even even like you say with your children. Yeah. I always think about, you know, the parents of children who are violent yeah. and who are abusive to them. And I think, well, yes, you would as a parent, you would always love them somehow, but mm. you, there, there has to be a condition if you're being hurt by somebody. Mm. It cannot be unconditional. Mm-hmm. That's not to say that. It, it would be easy no. to make a decision to cut that person off for mm-hmm. however long needed to be. Mm. But it is important to have those wider discussions about what unconditional love really means. Mm. Because there is a pressure to follow that. Yeah. And and even like it, romantic, uh, romantically, people think they're looking for unconditional love. Yes. And I remember being in a, in a course room and, and somebody said that, you know, we're talking about relationships and saying that they wanted a relationship. I'm just looking for unconditional love. And the facilitator is a very big hearted person. He was just like, come on. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like that's not realistic. Why yeah. would you want, uh, why, why you are you expecting that? And why are you, yeah, yeah. exactly. Like how, what if they they are abusive or if they don't give you what you need? Yeah. Are you still expected to love them regardless? Yeah, and boundaries. also, is, is that giving you permission as well? When you say, I want someone to love me unconditionally, are you expecting that whatever you do, that, that you're going to be like, there's no well, that's it. conditions yeah. to that? Yeah, yeah. Because if so you're... Someone should just take it. Yeah. Like whatever your love looks like. Yeah. No matter how toxic, they just take it. Yeah. There's a lot of misguided expectations about you know relationships of all sorts of relationships Mm. even work relationships the amount of people I know that would say that their boss was a real bully and I had a bully yeah Yeah. and it's like well then you are allowed to leave I know it's not easy but other people say yeah but it's a good job you're on good money it's a good company Mm. you know put up with it sort of thing and it's like no don't tell people to put up with being bullied Mm. you were how the, the, the real support would be like okay what are we going to do? How can I help you? Mm. 
yeah. how, how can I help you right now? Because this, you should never put up with being bullied. Mm. But the the society thing is, but it's it's Barclay Card or it's you mm-hmm. know above average pay for your age group, yeah. so you should really stick this out. Yeah, yeah. And so much of that goes on with all sorts of toxic relationships. Yes, it's true. So true. you you are at this point in your learning then mm. with Concord and all the other therapy. Have you tiptoed into being in front of the camera yet? So, let's see. So, I'm just trying to work. So, I did con- my first Concord program, 2006. I started acting 2003. So, two, so, so acting was the very first expression of, like, being in front of the camera for anything. Stand-up came later. So what I brought with me on the journey of being an actor was a load of insecurities and imposter syndrome because I didn't do the drama school route. Of course, yeah. So I, because I felt like I was 29, believe it or not, I was telling myself, I'm too old, I'm too old, I haven't got enough time. So I thought what I'll do is I'll do lots of like short workshops and programs and stuff like that. And I signed on for a a year of part-time actor training and and I'll treat every job that I do as an apprenticeship. That's, yes, that's, that's a good that's a good move though. It, it is and it isn't because, I mean, not that I would say, oh, I wish I had gone to drama school, but I feel like I might have believed in myself a little okay. bit more from earlier on. Yeah, if I had done that. Yeah. So the the confident. Yeah, that, that that bit was missing with all the bits that you were doing. I think so. Yeah, because just having a peer group and constantly being immersed and you know learning a skill set that you're constantly refining and honing. I didn't have that. Yeah, I, I was sort of d- d- dipping in and out, you know. And I was really lucky that I just worked right from the beginning. I, I hadn't even finished doing this part time year thing and I got my first acting job and was it luck though I I mean uh, yeah probably uh, yes really (laughs) it was was, there was some talent there but uh, you know quite ballsy to just go oh yeah I'm gonna be an actor (laughs) I I know that now because I know now how hard it is to be an actor because just sidebar the other day um, a girl asked me, uh, you know, I was just talking to some kids about, you know, my career and stuff and how I got where I got. And like, uh, she said, oh, how do you become an actor? And I found it really difficult to answer the question. I was sort of stumbling over my answer. And I realised because I realized that there's really two things, two different things that you can ask, two different ways that you can answer that question. One is, is your question, how do you get acting work yeah I could answer in that way yeah or the other way to answer is how do you become an actor i.e how do you hone the craft of really embodying a character authentically in the context of a play or a film yes. or, a, or a tv show that's a totally different question yeah to answer and Killian Murphy said the other day he reckons it takes 30 years I think I saw that. Was that shared on Instagram? So I must yeah, have made that. Yeah, I mean, into it's it. quite because it was you know during the campaign trail for Oppenheimer, and so yes, um, I you know I having decided some months earlier, I think I'd like to be an actor. Somehow now I'm doing a play when it takes you thirty years to become an actor. Wow, that's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Do you got know what I mean? You, so when you, you ask, is it luck or is it something else? There's a lot of luck. Yeah, because I haven't done thirty years of acting. I've done like six months. <laughs> but you must have been blooming good then. I was all right, you know. I was sort of, but it is. I can't. I can't express how much of a, a craft it is, and because people make it look easy, because all it, because what it looks like is just being a human being. Yeah. People make it. People like Olivia Coleman and Regina King and people like that. They make it look so easy when actually, it really is a craft yeah. to take these words on a page that are just vignettes really they're not the whole life yes but yet you have to make it look like there was one yes do you know what I mean yeah you take for granted how difficult that must be if you're not an actor and the only time you can really really spot it is when someone does it badly that's very true yeah so and 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 for the most part we don't get to see people doing it badly because they never 
got the job. Do you yes. know what I mean? They gave, they did a bad audition, but they that was the end of the road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's very right. rare that you'll get to see a bad performance. Yes. So also harder on stage, I would imagine, in many ways, because you you haven't got several takes. I uh, yeah, but you've got what you do get is you get a linear experience. Yes. Of the story, so yeah. so that helps because obviously with tv as you know like stuff is shot out yeah. of order so you're having to sort of like where's my character at, at this point even though in in terms of the timeline this happened like before the thing that i shot yesterday got you so you're trying to wrap your head around that, that makes sense yeah whereas in a play you go from the beginning of that person's experience of the story to the end yeah and and because it's live and in the moment you're that that makes it I, I would say easier as well yeah and also the fact that there's an audience there that sort of creates a containment that makes it easier I think than and the energy in the room yeah exactly yeah, yeah. so you can feel what they're feeling almost yeah and, and, they they, and their it. sort of their energy kind of is carrying you yeah kind of as well it's so hard I'd imagine it's a bit like when I was talking to Carly about the work that she does and she said something along the lines of that she was just the vessel for the work. It wasn't her. Mm-hmm. It came through her onto the paper. And I was like, as I, as a someone who cannot draw or paint to save my life, I was like, but you're definitely doing something. Mm. Like your hands and your ability mm-hmm. to... It's the same with acting. It it must... Like you say, it's a craft. It's, it's not just a case of, right, I'm going to embody this. You are having to do something to make that happen. Yeah. That is something maybe you can never put into words. Or articulate fully. No, and I, I think as well, like, for me, the journey is learning what toolkit you're... Because the reason I think people call it a craft is because you use tools. Yes. Same as with stand-up, you use tools. Like, you've got technique and tools. And so, uh, in terms of acting, you just find what tools you're going to use. Yes. Not tricks, but tools you're going to use to realise your characters. And what I'm also discovering is that different characters in different types of shows or projects require different tools. tools as well so you can't even just go right I've got my toolkit I know exactly what I'm going to do have to learn it I every do research time. and I do like yeah you have to learn it new every time which is why people like Meryl Streep you think she's lying when she says I start and I don't know what I'm doing you really don't because you're like what tools do I need yeah. for this? it's like a builder coming into a house it's like well what you did last time might not work in this place yeah you know because it's 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 a Tudor you know it's a Tudor place and therefore there's different materials and that's incredible I suppose that's why so many people you know like we think about the long running soaps like Corrie and EastEnders mm-hmm. And then you see someone leave. And I've always thought, why would they leave? Like, mm. this is regular pay. Are you crazy? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But actually, they're just not getting to learn new skills, That's are it. they? Because yeah. it's the same character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I get that more now. But I would still... Again, it's the security thing we were talking well, about. Well, that's it. I mean, and as a creative, you are, to a degree, inviting risk. Yes. By, go, by going into this. So, so I get why some would want to just stick with something that feels like less risky yes. by staying in a soap or something like that or a long running project but mo- most actors don't want to do that they want they, the even risk. if they were offered it they'd be like after a few years to be like i want to leave now <laughs> it's it's really interesting that area this is why i'm so fascinated by creative because i'm not really so i like to sort of but live. this is it sort of is yeah but, but you it's... don't count no i don't <laughs> count it as that okay. right. because i suppose i'm just being me the creativeness comes from you because I'm the same every time. But you didn't know you were going to say that. No, that's true. Or, and you didn't know necessarily all the questions you were going to ask me. So, Because my thing is when I did my podcast, I wanted it to be for everybody because I yeah. feel like everyone is being creative. In their and own there, way. And there's so many different ways that it can manifest. And we're all vessels. Yeah. We're yeah. all channeling yeah. something. And, it's, and, and the beauty is like, I, I, what I feel is that we are all channeling this universal energy and that who we are is kind of the flavor yeah I like that of how it comes out yeah I like so that. that's why Carly yeah she does have to put pen you know paintbrush to paper or whatever yeah. it is but she's the special source yeah that that's makes right. that universal energy yeah. come out in that way yes and then somebody else it comes out as poetry yes or it comes out through their acting yeah or their podcasting yeah no, that's a very good point. I, or how I, they dress or how they do their makeup and yeah. stuff like that. It's, well, that's true because I've always loved doing makeup, not because, well, yeah, I, I feel like I benefit from it, obviously. <laughs> you look fab. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I do like the creative process yeah. of putting makeup yeah. on. 
I've always liked that. Yeah. And and also, I don't really play around. I, I wear black most of the time. Uh-huh. But I like to wear different styles. Yeah, yeah. So it wouldn't just be like black jeans with a black shirt. Yeah, yeah. I would like wear little shorts or a skirt or, or leg. You know, I do feel like expressing yourself that way is important. But that's all creativity. Yeah. And you've given yourself this parameter, which I think create makes things people more creative when there's parameters of yeah. black black yes. and then how do I style this yes. black I do a little detail yeah. around the neck and I'll do shorts on tights yeah. and, you know. yeah. and then that that to me is your that's universal energy thro- flowing yeah. through you just as much as somebody who is an actor or a painter yeah I'm, I'm really that, that's a very very good point and actually for people listening that don't think they're creative as well and well, also like you know what do you like to cook do you do you go from a recipe or are you just making it up? That's I make great. it up. Well, that's creativity, yeah. you know. So if people are doing that, that that's a form of it as well. Or maybe it, it expresses itself in how you design your home. Yeah, there's so many different ways, and I think people, I think people would be happier. I think we would be happier as a society if we were more connected with our creativity. I think you are right, and I think I like. I'm very visual, mm-hmm. so I'm drawn to visual things. Whether that be, it, I do like people's homes and I do like to look at what other people do in their homes. Mm. Also, I, I probably could get really lost in that mm-hmm. because it's so, it's imagining yourself in it, isn't mm-hmm. it? Which I suppose is a bit of the character thing again. Mm-hmm. Like what character would I be in that house? Why, mm-hmm. do I, why do I like that style of house? Or, But also with books, I've never been one to stick to a, a genre of right. I, I do like com- comedy and I like thriller. Mm-hmm. I like the I like the real extreme ha 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 <laughs> or the darkest stuff okay. ever. Yeah, There's, yeah, I'm not really middle ground. I do like extremes. Mm-hmm. So again, when I see somebody's done their home, I might not be able to live in it. But you know the Lawrence Llewellyn Bowen thing when they're wild in their home and they oh, take risks, okay, right. when they're going to live... I wouldn't necessarily do that. Yeah, yeah. But I'm intrigued by that. Yeah. Because it's so much. Mm-hmm. But they, they need that around them. Yeah, it's like an expression of who they are. I yeah. Suppose, it's an I mean, that's what your home is, isn't it? It's an yeah. extension of who you are. Yeah, it is, yeah. So it's, it is fascinating. But I suppose yours is more... Because you're using yourself, your body, your voice, to to be creative, does it feel more risky like you said you know actors are they like the risk uh, probably because I write as well and I don't yeah. feel as exposed <laughs> with yes. that as I do with I mean obviously I guess of all the things that I've done stand-up is probably the most exposing yes because... please talk to me about that because that is like for it's me weird isn't it <laughs> yeah why would anyone do that <laughs> yeah I mean I, as I said, I don't know if I said it on since we've been recording, but I obviously did know who you were because mm-hmm. I've seen you on the telly. And um, I, I always think you are very funny. Thank you. And and you've made me laugh a lot today, oh, so I'm cool. not just making that up. <laughs> okay. But to, to make someone laugh is, if it's accidental, great. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, great, that was funny. But when you actually are trying to make people laugh, I can't think of anything. Worse. Yeah, I mean it's funny because I have thought about this of like what because so many people say I don't know how you do it. It's the scariest thing. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. and I I just think well look here's what it comes down to is it's the scariest thing for you. Yes, you know the scariest thing for me would be to allow somebody to judge my value by who I'm being rather than what I'm doing. Yeah, <laughs> you know okay, I mean? that's, that's a good like point. That. Yeah, so that so so when you look at stand ups. Just know that for them, it is not the scariest thing. Because if it was, they wouldn't do it. True. However, you did the big shows. I did. Like you, yeah. I mean, and and I don't know how many people are in those theatres. It's usually two or three thousand, isn't it? Yeah, I think like the Apollo is like three and a half, something like that. Yeah, I mean that's yeah. a lot of people. It is a lot of people. Yeah. Is, I know this is a really awful question because everybody will ask this question, uh-huh. and the only context I have to it is. I'm a very mediocre singer, and I say very mediocre with no accident. <laughs> that is very true. Okay. But I'm a bit of a winger, uh-huh. and I will go in and say, I'm a singer, yeah. will you pay me? And if they say yes, uh-huh. I'll just do it. Sweet. So I did the small audiences, uh-huh. which is quite difficult mm-hmm. because they are usually two feet away from you. Mm-hmm. Um, and so what I did, actually, funnily enough, is try to be funny and, like, Oh. warn them that I'm not the best singer you know yeah, like sure, give them sure. that 
don't expect Mariah Carey because you're going to be disappointed. If that's what you want to leave now, that yeah. kind of stuff. Uh -huh. Because then they know what they're going to get uh -huh. and they know I can do the banter thing already. Uh -huh. So if they would be heckling me or whatever, I would join in. I'd be like, oh, I know I'm so disappointed in myself. <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> Imagine, yeah. Right. <laughs> like, this is worse for me than you, trust me. You know, so I would do that, and I think that's why I was able to get away with it. Yeah, yeah. Because I was just going to play it down. Yeah, that's brilliant. But I was earning good money, mm -hmm. more than the ones that could actually sing. Uh -huh. So that's the context to the small audience. They are there and they are on you. Yeah. But you can have a relationship. Yeah. The bigger audience, and I think the biggest I've ever done is a TED Talk, which was maybe, yeah, 100 people or whatever, so it's not uh -huh. that big. Uh -huh. That scared me a million times more. Right. But some people say it's the other way around. They get scared with the small audience. But with the TED Talk, was that because you knew that potentially it could be seen by a lot of people? Yes. Yeah. So so potentially the audience, the immediate audience might be small, but the later audience yeah, could be Yeah, because I massive. think the channel was like 35 million that it it's goes huge, to. Though, so. Yeah. So yeah. that was always at the back of my mind. Like, if I do this and it goes wrong, it's out there forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Which I can again, imagine yeah, that you, would be... But you know what that's like because when you've done the Apollo, it's been on the BBC and, you know, millions of people will see this. Yeah, yeah. But you obviously didn't think that way. Well, what did I think? Um, I think the thing is, is because people do ask about shows like the Apollo and the, the, the truth is, is that you're doing lots and lots of gigs up until that point. Yes. You know, I could have done five, six, seven hundred gigs varying sizes before I you know did live at the Apollo yeah and the particular production company that make that show they kind of had sort of tested me out on smaller gigs right and then it's a little bit bigger and then it was like McIntyre's Roadshow yeah and then the next gig was Apollo Got so I've you. proved myself over and over and over again yes so that by the time you get there I I was scared like don't get me wrong I was backstage just like nervous want it to go well and all the rest of it couldn't eat blah 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 but I've I've kind of already done similar shows yes you know yeah you again the craft Yes. you've honed it by that point and that's it and that's why um you know uh, uh, I don't know if it's, this is Denzel Washington's phrase or whether he was repeating it, but he was saying preparation uh, plus timing equals luck. Yeah, so when we talk yeah, about yeah, yeah. someone lucky, yeah. it's, you know, they were probably ready for that opportunity. Yes. Because a lot of times, you know, people might have got lucky by, say, something going viral. Yes. Yeah. Right. So say they're a singer and they do, they do a, an Adele cover or something and it goes viral. Yeah. But have you got anything else? No, they don't. Do they have anything on Spotify? That's so no, true. they don't. So, so they're true. not they're not ready. So the opportunity passes them by. They get instant fame, but then it goes. Exactly. Yeah. So so that was like yeah, they had the opportunity, but they yeah. didn't have the preparation. Yes. So so that doesn't. That's very luck. profound, actually, for a lot of people that are trying to be to a, a guy called Billy Lockett came on and he's been working in the background supporting um, Lana Del Rey and yeah. uh, what's the other one Lewis Capaldi mm -hmm. ELO all these big names but he's been doing it for 14 years mm. um, and he's had the ups and downs in the music industry support done really big crowds like 20,000 small crowds and he's doing really well at the minute but very independently and he said the same thing there's someone else from our town um, that blew up on TikTok mm -hmm. and had like however million, many, million streams. But actually, beyond that, there's not a lot going. And yeah. that's not her fault. That's yeah. just the nature of that going viral. Yeah. So there you are doing hundreds of gigs mm -hmm. before you have that massive spotlight. That's it, yeah. And did you feel when you were there, like, oh, I am, I know I'm nervous, yes, because I think that's normal, mm. but I deserve to be here. Ooh, <laughs> yeah. No, I wasn't thinking. <laughs> Interesting. That's, that's not a thought I, I often have. Yeah. If I deserve this, or I, you know what I mean. That's that. See, that's powerful in itself. That there you are. That's the. I would imagine the dizzy heights of where a comedian wants to be. That's like I would imagine, yeah. like if you're in the starting. UK, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm, the Apollo. That's the big thing. Yeah. And you get there, and you don't have the conscious thought that you deserve it. But I also didn't think I don't deserve it. So it wasn't either or, it was just it like... Was, it was just, I don't think I had the capacity to really process to that level. Yeah. It was a little bit of just like... 
all energy going towards just doing the best yes. I could because you got is you know just like Eminem says you got one shot yeah yeah, Do you know yeah. What I mean? this is it <laughs> this is it so um yeah it was it was more it was more like that so it wasn't like I was having doubts it was more like it's just everything was Focus. focused on just like just be great <laughs> and was it an anti-climax at all after yeah I'll tell you what was interesting and I think I think this happens to other comics as well is like after you've done a big gig like that your next gig invariably is always shit yeah. no matter like <laughs> where yeah. where you're on at like and I don't know what it is maybe it's maybe you know it's the peak of adrenaline yeah. and then yeah. there's no you haven't got that same adrenaline in your body which keeps you alert and yes. on kind of thing but yeah I remember having a terrible gig the next night and you're just thinking I was like on stage in front of 3,000 people just like the night, just last night. Like, why is this going so badly? Yeah, that but, is crazy, yeah, really, it's just isn't one of those it? Things. I think you're right, though. It's the adrenaline response. Mm. It, it just makes everything more acute and tuned in, doesn't it? Yeah. And interestingly, sidebar, just about like these, you know, d doing comedy, especially the panel shows. I found this more with the panel shows, but like just an ad ad yeah. adrenaline response to it. Um, I I used to come off of Mock the Week and just like took me hours to get to sleep afterwards. Hours. Did it really? Yeah. Because that because was a... I was, yeah, because it's such a high stress environment, high stakes, high stress environment. And it, the recording is quite long. It's is like it? It's like three, three and a half hours sometimes. Yeah. Um, sometimes panel shows, I mean, the longest one I was on, like took nearly five hours to do. It was like, anyway, torture, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it took me ages to get to sleep. And, um, I'd be sort of processing, why didn't you say that? Why didn't you say that? Oh, what about that bit? Was it okay? Will it, you know, is it going to edit? Okay. Blah, blah, blah. And then I heard Rio Ferdinand talking about after he'd come off, uh, the pitch yeah. and stuff, taking ages to get to sleep. Yeah. And I was like. Of course. Like yeah. I was giving myself a hard time about it. Like, why aren't you able to fall asleep? And I realized it's, it's just adrenaline. like, yeah, like that, that it is such a big moment. Yes. And you're, and like all those stress hormones or whatever, like everything's firing in your body. Like, yeah. and your body is just like, can you give me a second <laughs> to just. <laughs> So you would literally be up tossing and turning all yeah, night? Yeah, till like, say I got home at 11 or something or 12, I'd be like two, three hours of just like, just my. Yeah. Just going. It's going, a strange going. feeling that, isn't it? Yeah. Where, where it's almost like, uh, I guess my ears go a bit muffled in those situations. It's like I know what you mean. Yeah. 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 Do you know what I mean? Because it's, it's so consuming. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's a very strange feeling. Not that I've had that experience, but similar things where I've been really switched on. Yeah. Yeah. Everything yeah. like the the, the the sound just feels different around yeah. me. It's like tunnel vision for a bit. Mm, mm, so. Mm. How long did you do the comedy stuff for? Because you, you've sort of like not finished it, but you don't do it actively at the moment, do you? Certainly. Like Harry and Meghan, I'm stepping away. <laughs> <laughs> Was there a press release? Yeah, That's right. What I want to know. And a privacy tour. And no, bless them. an interview with Oprah to That's discuss it. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I, um, so it, it was very gradual, but I started to have a sense that it wasn't a fit anymore. Yeah. Um. And, you know, when you look back, you start to get clarity about something. But I just knew at the time, it's just, just starting to feel like not right yeah. for me. And so in the end, it was seven years. So I started in 2007. I did a, a stand-up comedy course, I think, yeah, 2006. And it, and it, I think we graduated in 2007. And then my first gig was in March. And then someone was like, oh, you should, you should enter the Funny Women Awards. And uh, to me, that sounded like you should enter yourself into the BAFTAs because I heard award, right? It's just a competition. Yeah. I didn't realise yeah. it was just a competition. And I was like, I couldn't possibly. <laughs> I'm not ready. I've just done one game. <laughs> when they were just saying, basically, why don't you enter a comedy competition? <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> um, so, and then, yeah, so basically seven years. And, uh, and the interesting thing is I just realised relatively recently that my star, quote unquote, just burned for a very short time, very brightly, but for a, yeah. actually a really short time. Yeah. I did not really get any traction around telly until I did little bits, but nothing that would have people know who I was, no matter. Until my first Mock the Week was 2010. I knew who you were. Yeah, but 2010. That's when I did my first Mock the Week. Right. And I ended up doing five of those, two Live at the Apollos and some other bits and pieces. My last Live at the Apollo was 2012. 
Interesting. So literally,、yeah. it wasn't even a whole two years. It was probably like eighteen months where I was like <laughs> super、yes. famous, like you know, doing all the panel shows and、yeah. you know what not, what not. And then two thousand twelve, I'm like, mm 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 mm, <laughs> this is not right. Wow. So- and I, I'd only realised that recently because I thought. Uh, I thought I'd had this seven-year career where it was super intense, and that's what I was reacting to. But it was to. the two, the eighteen months. It was those eighteen months. Yeah, it's like no, this isn't.、It. And then you went, no, thank you, no, thank you. What was it that? What was the final decision around that? Was it just a feeling, and it wasn't like a oh, I really don't want to do this anymore. It's just oh, I can't be bothered. Not I can't be bothered. It was it was a、uh, most of what I do since I started since I left、um, sort of. The post-production world,、yeah. the sort of more technical operational jobs that I was doing, everything's been by feel. By feel, feel、yeah. it's almost like I'm in a room, and the mo- the the most information I'm going to get is if I feel my way. Yes, yes, you know, yes. like trying to find find the, the the way through. And so I again had another episode of depression, and this was the one that was very acute. This was. It came off the back of a workshop. It was nothing to do with the workshop. I think that just revealed what was already there, and I. I couldn't. I couldn't work. Yeah. Like I was, you know, struggling to get out of bed at this、yeah. point. And I remember I had some things in the diary that I was like to my agent, like this is. So these things are going to have to come out. And there was one thing. It was so odd. It was like I was going to narrate a,、um, a performance of Peter and the Wolf. Wow.、Uh, yeah. I know it's like random. <laughs> and then it was at the local theatre, and I. Ella, I can't even tell you the、um, effort it took to get there, and it was literally a mile up the road. Yeah, and it took me so long to get dressed, so long to get my makeup on. I didn't even have to learn anything. All I was doing was reading. Um, it was all yeah, it was all just off off a script kind of thing. I was late. I remember I turned up late, but which would normally really、uh, irritate me. I don't、yeah. like turning up late for things, but I was just like, I can't believe I'm even here. Like I was so like it in it、um, that yeah even just getting to a place a mile up the road just like I was just like fuck it how did you do that yeah 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 I know that feeling actually where it just feels like it's impossible but it's you're impossible. doing it while I just I, can, I just can't I just I I don't consciously remember thinking it's impossible but I just remember thinking. The only way I was, I was sort of like having to strategize,、yes. and the only way that I found that I could navigate, well, just it was acute for probably like two weeks or something. But like, is is literally going one step at a time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As soon as I started to think, even an hour ahead, sometimes、yes. the the weight of the 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 dread because、yeah. my depression just manifests as dread. dread. The weight of it would just like leave me immobile. Like I、yeah. couldn't, I couldn't have cooked a meal for myself. Like, yeah, you just, just. We've kind just of had that feeling when you're flu-y, isn't it? When you've had a real proper flu, not a cold, but、yeah. like a flu, and it's like even just trying to get up to go to the toilet feels like a feat that can never be achieved. <laughs> yeah, I guess, and、uh, and I suppose, but the, but it's not in the body; it's in the, it's mind, in the mind affecting the body. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that was.、Uh, so then, so I had that. And so took some stuff out of the diary. Started seeing Stella again. God bless her. Good old Stella. Good old Stella. She's, there for me. Thank yeah, gosh. Yeah. And then、um, yeah. And then and then <laughs> one night I was just like googling working in America. <laughs> just like, so this is the next big this step. Is, yeah, like work, working in America,、uh, Hollywood. Just googling a bunch of stuff, and I found this this guy. Who was who was running these like networking weeks in in Hollywood, and he would introduce you to like agents and managers and acting coaches and stuff like that, and all the testimonials were so like glowing of this this person that I thought well it's clearly a scam, <laughs> <laughs> too good to be true, too good to be true. But I couldn't find anything that said that was anything other than what these people were saying. So I was like, do you know what? I'm so, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna I'm gonna go. And there's one coming up. It was maybe a month away or something like that. So I just booked a flight to LA and you know chat with this chap and yeah went out there and all by yourself. Yeah, and 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 actually, but the, 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 I was still sort of in the throes of the depression, and so I got there. And、um, have you ever been to LA? No, I haven't. So it's very.、Um, 
it does feel quite, or, or you can have quite a lonely experience when I've you first get that. get there. Everyone always talks about how it's so spread out, but it yeah. is. There really isn't. What there is is lots of places that have got a center or got a busy bit. Yeah. But there, but there's loads of places like that, so it doesn't ever feel like it's a cohesive one. Yeah. There's no such thing as central LA. Like we've got a central London. Yes. You know, so, um, so I was. Uh, in a hotel and I was not near stuff I didn't know where anything was I didn't know anybody there I I arrived I think like a week before this thing started or a few days before it started so I was really like not and fragile as well yeah. so I was really like not in in good shape so I was I I, I called the guy and I said look um I'm going home <laughs> did you yeah I've, I I said I've changed my flight I'm I'm really I can't do this I'll he had another one coming up, I think, in May. This was April. He said he had another one the next month. I was like, I know you don't do refunds, but can you move it to, can you move my thingy to May? And he's like, look, I I, I don't do refunds, but, I, and I'm not saying this f- f- because of your money or anything like that, but don't go home. I promise you, if you stay, you will, you, you'll, you'll regret it if you go home. Just stay, do the thing, move hotel, come to the hotel where you're all going to be staying um Aww. so that you'll 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 feel more like in it more part of yeah. it sort of thing and it was a little bit of a busier area so I'd literally I'd changed my flights I spent like 250 quid just changing the flight so I was like <laughs> you were uh, determined yeah I really was because normally like if this was a, a cry for help I wouldn't have changed the flight yeah. but I was just like no nah, bro I'm going home so, yeah. <laughs> so I changed the flight back again and um moved moved hotel that night, there was some felons in the room next door. It was one of those motels. <laughs> it's like there's some felons next door. And I literally saw the blue lights of the police and like banging on the door. Wow. So I was like, is this really the best hotel for me? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so I did the, um, so the other guys who were on this thing, they turned up. And we had this week in Hollywood and it was just like one of the best experiences of oh my, my life. Gosh. I am so glad I stayed. But it wasn't necessarily about um, who, we, who we met. And we had some really cool experiences. We went into some big agencies and, and met cool, you know, some cool agents who are looking after really, really interesting, like A-list sort of actors and stuff. It was the bond, you know, like yeah. with all the other actors because... There's something about LA that allows you to be whoever you want kind yes. of thing or let you or allows you to let go of the things that you don't want to be. Yeah. Even yeah, just for yeah. a little bit. Yeah. You know. And so I really like I don't think I really experienced that sense of depression at all like that whole week. That's insane. Yeah, from just from the the, the level of connection because there was a lot of Brits on there and Australians and it wasn't I don't think there were any Americans so it's always it was all people that come from different parts of the world yeah so there was that connection you know in that like cultural connection in that respect and it was all people that just wanted something different for themselves yes which is very inspiring isn't it exactly and that and that I think gave us all a bit of freedom to just like just think who do I want to be what do I want for myself can I make that happen you know. And can I reference the age you were when you did this? Because, again, this is important to say, just because I think you you mentioned earlier, I think, at like 29, you mm. thought you were old. Mm. and Or too old to go to old. drama school. That's yeah, it. yeah. And yet you are in L.A. at 40. Yeah. So this isn't something you did at 25, like, no. I'm going to go and find myself. No. You'd already had quite, well, a very successful career mm. where you'd blown up for that short period of time uh-huh. but you've been working at it for longer uh-huh. BBC work you know doing well depression hits at the age of 40 I want to go to LA mm. and try something new mm. and that's really important because I think particularly women not maybe it's not so much now mm-hmm. but I'm 45 and I know that as I was growing up in my 20s 40 was like mm. you know I know it says I think that the phrase used to be life begins at 40 but actually mm-hmm. 40 year olds they really were a little bit older than what we are now. Yeah, I'd say. They yeah. were. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember my nan, who, when I was seven, she was around 67. Mm-hmm. And she really looked what you would consider someone at 87. Mm-hmm. It's almost like everything shifted by about 20 years. Mm. So when you went to LA, that was still like a, an age which women are considered to be older, mm. old. Mm. You know, you don't... 
Not necessarily an age that you would you would associate with making big life changes. Yes, yeah, that's what I'm trying to say, and I'm. I don't mean to be offensive to any women that have done because I I continue to do new things at my mm-hmm. age, mm-hmm. and I don't, we said earlier don't, I don't feel my age. It's not like I go, oh, I'm 45. I probably shouldn't start a podcast. That's it. Yeah, I don't think that way. Yeah, yeah. But it, when you reflect back on the generation before us, they would never have even considered it. It would have been rare, wouldn't it? And, yeah. But I, yeah, I, I, same as you, I don't really, I wasn't really thinking in those terms. Yeah. Again, it was that feeling your way through and I'm feeling like what I need is to make a change. Yeah. So after that week, yeah, I, I managed to, I, I got a job, I got a visa to, to be out there. So I was able to stay for a period of time. And so I, I and I said to my agent, I said, look, I'm just going for a break, but I just, I really need a break. I was a, probably burnt, burnt out. Burnt out, yeah. Because I think one of the things with stand-up is that when I see stand-ups these days, especially ones that I used to be on the circuit with, I'm just like, wow, you look so tired. Yeah. You just look so tired. You're very successful. Yeah. But you look knackered, mate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, and that would have been me, like, yeah. then. It's because you're constantly... What's great is you're constantly asked to do stuff. Yes. But what's terrible is you're constantly asked to do stuff. It's <laughs> true. It's so true. It gets... And you don't know what thing to turn down. Yeah. And, you don't, and you're not... You're like, well, what if it all runs out? I remember Hugh Dennis who, like, you know, yeah. national treasure, yeah. you know, beloved actor and, and, you know, funny guy. And even he was having that mindset of just like, well, you never know. You know, you never I mean, know. But I suppose there's a truth in that, which is when will they decide my time's up? That is true. That is true. Because you, that... you're not the arbiter of it, are yeah. you? There's like trends and forces and yes. who's relevant and who's... Yeah, yeah. so... Um, yeah, so a little, a little bit burnt out. And so I just said, look, I, I'm only going for a few months. I, I, I plan to go, I had a three year visa, but I plan to go for, um, six months. I said, in fact, May, I think I was going to come home. And I think it took a month for me to go, I'm staying. <laughs> Forever. <laughs> yeah, I'm staying. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah. How long were you there for? In the end, I was there for six years. So I had a, a green card, so uh, which is a residence visa, basically, yeah. which is great because it means that you don't have to... You can work in any field, whereas yeah. some visas that people end up out there on, they can only work in a certain field and sometimes only for a certain employer. Got you. So I, I had a residence visa, so I was I was free to, 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 be, to come and go as well. So I was doing a little bit of work here. I started presenting this show called Super Shoppers, which was kind of really helpful because I-, I wanted to find out whether I would enjoy presenting as yes. it turns out it wasn't really for me but like it it subsidized me being in LA so I come wow, home yeah present super shoppers like you know a month's work say yeah and then go back and then continue hustling basically but um I never like I never blew up in in LA I worked I got some nice jobs I did you know Shazam and Lights Out and things like yeah. that and little bits and pieces here and there and did some stand up on the late nights but I, the biggest thing that I took from it was giving myself permission to be more than what I had become Yeah. prior to leaving the UK. So all I felt I was, was a stand-up. That's how everybody related to me because that's yeah. what they, they knew me for. Yeah. And I think, I don't know if Americans are like this, but Brits are very protective of their comedians. Yes. You know, they don't want them to really do anything else or be anything no, else you're right with that no, don't don't be doing the acting and yeah, the yeah. other things yeah yeah actually if michael mcintyre wanted to go and do some serious acting yeah i'm not sure how that would go the down. grief he would get i know i mean he'd probably be great He'd probably and, be and amazing. people would come come round yeah. to it. but like it's not an easy transition no. because brits love their comedians yeah they you know do. They and they're, do. they're really actually very loyal and supportive and even now i still get this is seven years after i stopped doing it yeah m- m- maybe more actually no pro- yeah it's probably about seven years now yeah people still relate to me in that way yeah even though i've got a whole seven years of doing just a bunch of different things yeah so like writing you mentioned like is yeah. it two books you've done now? two books working on the third yeah wow yeah so you've really started to express and explore and the acting as well, because what was the, was the BBC Three thing that you've done recently? Um, Am I thinking that there's a, where you were a vicar? Oh, that was on Sky. That, that was, was Sky. For, um, sorry. Yeah, no, that's cool. It's Breeders. Yeah, yeah, so that's little, it. That's it. Yeah, a little bit on Breeders. Yeah, I mean, all all of that's possible because of 
what I got from being in a, in LA mm. of the permission to give to, I gave myself to be more than what I more than how I was seen to hone my craft so I did this amazing um I found an amazing sort of studio actor studio where I really dug down into what it means to be an actor by the Killian Murphy definition yes. rather than find acting work yes and um those all those years of stand up they helped me get rid of that imposter syndrome vibe yeah because i felt like i've earned my stripes yeah i may not have done it through going to rada for 3 years but i've really grafted here and i've do you know what I mean? So combining that with that, uh, the the acting studio I went to just really helped me to sort of improve my craft and hone it and believe in what I could do. So is that where the I deserve to be here comes in? Yeah, I think probably uh, the, yeah, yeah. More I, of that feeling. A bit though. more. <laughs> You're still like, I'm not so sure now you know, you've asked me the direct question. I thought, it's, yeah, deserve to be here. I suppose partly the reason that I don't think about that is because it hasn't been questioned. Yeah. You know, so there's no one going, do you deserve to be here? And then I have to say, I do. Well, how about if I ask that question now? Do you think that you deserve to be on the stage, on the telly, whatever it is that you're doing, writing the books, being successful? Yes, isn't that interesting? I think what I feel like more is, well, I am. Yeah. Because... What does that mean? Like I deserve to be there. You would have to feel that. That again. But, but, but what does it even like? Are you saying I should be there, or because it's all so by chance? Especially in our game. You yeah, know, I it, suppose I'm relating it to maybe my own, which is if I'm quite comfortable to say that I'm a really good therapist mm-hmm. and that I deserve to be where I am. Mm. But I also really encourage other people to find that in themselves. That's the one thing that I'd say the three things I focus on are breaking the trauma cycles and understanding them in the first place Mm -hmm. and then earning money so that you can really change those, I guess, trauma cycles of poverty if Mm -hmm. if that person has experienced that, which a lot of people have. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing is that you deserve it all. Like Mm -hmm. you always did deserve it all. You've learned that you didn't deserve it through society or growing up school Mm. whatever it is that you've experienced but when you're born as the baby Mm -hmm. and you come into this world joyous curious and naturally compassionate Mm -hmm. you deserve it all we would never look at a baby and go that one there that hasn't got much hair doesn't deserve deserve it (laughs) so we're just going to put him in a box or her in a box yeah that one there looks like they do deserve it yeah so we don't we don't understand i think until we get to a wiser age yeah that we've always deserved it if you're working at it and you're willing to put your soul into it Mm -hmm. and you're showing up you deserve it i guess because of the amount of chance that's in my particular industry i'm not entirely comfortable with deserve right because there's so many people that deserve it that don't get it i hear that i get you know what i mean but what i would say is that i've put in a lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of energy. Yeah. And invested a lot of my own money as well, like yes. sometimes to make something happen. So that if it does, I think that makes sense to me. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> You know, yeah, that's yeah. what I could say. It makes sense. Yeah. it may, Like I don't feel any disconnect between me being in that opportunity. Yeah. And, well, me being in that opportunity, does it? Um, so, yeah, that's a, I think that's probably the most I could say. Well, that's I could, really could go as far as like yeah. deserve. I must admit, when you said that about there's really talented people, I think about shows like The Voice or X Factor even. Right. And you hear these incredible yeah. voices and you see the background. They've been doing backing singing for a while. Yeah. Or and they just don't get mm-hmm. through. And you're like, how would you not put that person yeah. through? They yeah. deserve to go through. I understand what you mean by that. That makes more sense. Yeah. So um, but I, I, I wonder if that's specific to the arts. Yes, I that, think That's right. sort of like... Kind of a little bit deserve schmurf because there's like so many yes. talented people. It's more like I I make sense here because yeah. of the commitment that I've made yes. and the investment that I've made in myself. Yeah, that's really useful having that bit of a conversation cool. for me personally mm-hmm. because that was all that was across the board for me. But mm-hmm. like you deserve it. Mm. End of story. Mm-hmm. But then comparatively, you've got to look at the people that also deserve it that don't get there. Yeah. But I suppose that's. 
But that's also true of life, actually. Well, yeah, there I mean, are... sometimes I think about, and this is, I don't want to get into any controversies here, but like when we talk about human rights, yes, it's like, well, they, they've kind of arbitrarily been created. Yeah. So to, because, you know, you get to a point where people go, people have the right to, yes. da, 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 and it's like, no, that's, no, I'm yeah, going to yeah, disagree yeah, yeah. on that one. I'm going to push back on, you know, because it's super random or specific. Yeah. specific. So, so. What you want is there to be a society where these things are possible or these things, there's room for people to ha- to be allowed to yeah. have these things. But I don't know if all the things that we say are right or that people deserve yeah. actually are. Yeah. We just want, a, we just really want to live in a society where we don't even have to discuss that because we're taking care of each other. Yes, yes, yes. That's a very good point. I had a really good um, sort of career coach who kind of coaches performers. Yeah. And... What through him, one of the things that I saw that I think a lot of creatives struggle with is just too many things on the plate on or too many plates spinning. Yes. And what I say is like, if you're happy with what your career looks like with all those plates spinning and your and your path is moving as uh, you're moving along your path as quickly as you want to, then no problem. But if you're getting frustrated, go, why isn't my singing taking off? Yeah. And you're doing singing and you're podcasting and you're doing this and that yeah. and, and you're in five bands and you know what I mean? Yeah, you're doing yeah, a bit yeah. of acting on the side. And, yeah. Well, babe, that's why your singing's not working out because you're spread best. so thin. Yeah. And all your energy is getting dissipated across all those different things. And that's exactly what I was doing. So when I went to America, what I ended up doing is like trying lots of different things in the hope that something would stick because if anybody's going to make it at something it's it's often there if anyone's going to blow up on TikTok or if anyone's going to well not the TikTok was around at that point but you know or or whatever it was as a director or writer it was there yeah I'll try that I'll try that I'll try that and before I knew it I was trying so many different things and my energy was just scattered across such a good point yeah all these different disciplines and through this coaching, he helped me see, well, first we'll come up with what the vision was, even if that changes, yeah. like what that is. And then knowing what that is, then you can look at, well, what's in service of that? Yes. Ah, that's got nothing to do with it. That was just fun. Yeah. That's got nothing to do with it. That was just about money and you were actually quite miserable doing it. That's got nothing to do that's everything to do with it that's everything to do with it do those two things it was acting and it was writing so what made you choose because obviously you've written two books now I've I've written a book and it took me two years mm. so I don't and it, and I I always say I'm very honest it's, if I was to do it again I'd do it different mm. I don't although it's had some great feedback I don't actually I'm not that comfortable with it okay you won't I, I do say I've written a book but I don't really promote it right and I think there's a sense of if I was to do that again, I'd do it better. Mm-hmm. But I know, and I know people can use AI and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But I know I wouldn't do that if I'm doing it again. Good I'd have you. to do it again. Yeah, yeah. Or I'd have to do another version of it or an upgraded version of it. Or just a new book. A new book. And I just think it's so hard. So obviously you, again, it's what we said about the comedy thing. Yeah, but it's not scary for, for the comedian. Like, it's not the scariest thing in the world for us. Do you feel like it's quite a natural thing for you? I mean, I've always wanted to write, you know, there's definitely that. And so in a way it was natural, but not necessarily writing books. I I just didn't think it through. I I sort of stumbled into this situation where I was offered a a, a book deal, which obviously, as you know, involves an advance. Yeah. And so I was just like, cool. (laughs) (laughs) I will take it. They were were going to give me some money. And then I didn't really think about, well, what's... What do you have to do to get the money again? <laughs> I'll write a book. Okay, copy that. Copy a that. whole book. A whole book. You just don't want the the uh, amazing <laughs> idea that I had. You want me to actually write the book. Okay, go, 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 go. And so, you know, that was quite a journey. Like, that was a real slog because I did not know how little, I didn't realise how little I knew about writing a book. It's so Hard. It's so hard. And the thing is, I mean, I used to joke with people saying, you know, it's just so many words. <laughs> and like, they have to be good words. You can't just write and, 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 and they go finish. I know. You know, you have to pick really good words and they all have to be good words. And they, they have to all be engaging. Make, they have to uh, engaging and make sense. 
Ugh. <laughs> you know, it was it was so hard. And like the first draft that I sent through, I remember my editor who's really, the editors are always really lovely in publishing. Yeah. They're really kind, even when they have to say something that's like, this is shit. They say it in the kindest, <laughs> most like loveliest, genteel way. And so she was like, this is a really great start. Really positive. <laughs> Something like that. But, but, <laughs> feedback sandwich. Uh, but she said, um, it does read a little bit like a script in the sense of like, there's a lot of dialogue and not a lot of, um, you know, you give, give the reader time to sort of uh, understand what the characters are feeling or something like that. And basically, I, in hindsight, I can see that what I'd actually done is basically written a script. Yeah. I wasn't really in the mindset of literature. And the story behind the characters. Exactly. So I wasn't, I I mean, I used to read all the time when I was younger. And so, and I had, you know, internalized some of the structure of how, but not so much because you're so, you're enjoying it. Yes. You're just in it. It's like when you're watching a TV show that's great. You're not thinking about the production. I'm not thinking about how they wrote that. Yeah. I'm just like, oh my God, they did that to such and such character. So, so I really had to go on a proper, I was Googling stuff all the time I remember yeah. Paul Kay said when he got Game of Thrones I don't know if this is if he was joking when he said this but he literally googled how to act and wow. because he was just so intimidated by the by the opportunity <laughs> I mean he's a great actor so it's probably like him just like making us all feel better <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but I was literally googling stuff about how to write because I was just like what are the rules like, yeah. I, I don't know if I know them yeah so it was a real and about three quarters of the way into the process, of course, I didn't know I was three quarters of the way in at that time. I got to the point where I was like, I don't want this. Yes. I'm not going to be able to do this. Yeah. I was talking to my agent about how, what, what's the process of giving back the advance, even though I'd spent it? Like, what's the process? Can I give them of- back £20 a month for the next <laughs> yeah, 15 exactly. years? Could we come up with some kind of plan, like a payment plan where I just, <laughs> I'm in debt to them forever. And he was, he was really good because he was like, it, he used the analogy of a marathon and it really was like that. Yeah. He was that person that was in the crowd at mile 23 yeah. going, you can do this. Come on, come Aww. on. And so he would really cheer me on from the sidelines. They're like, I wish I could have the baby for you. <laughs> like, <laughs> that yeah. kind of thing. But um, yeah, that really helps get me over the finishing line. But my goodness, it is, it is what not easy. What did you have easy. to do for like time wise to get that done? Like, for people that are interested in writing, I mean, like I said, it took me two years to do my book. Uh-huh. And it's because I, I stopped and started a lot. I took Same. loads of time off because I was just, I, I'm not doing it. I'm yeah. not doing it. Yeah. The only person that would have lost there was me. Yeah. But I was being that petulant child. Mm. I don't want to do it. It's a stupid idea. I can't do it. And then one day, it's flow state, isn't it? You mm. just find yourself in flow state and then you get loads done and then it stops again. Mm. So how long overall do you think that took for you to do the first Both one? of them have taken about two and a half years, yeah. as in from the start to, to the, the finish. finish I yeah. haven't been writing consistently yeah. for two and a half years. Yeah. But but the first attempt or the first draft or first section of a draft, I didn't finish the whole thing in that period, it took so long because I, I was trying to perfect every paragraph, every phrase thinking I don't want notes I want this to be so good yeah. that they don't have to give me notes well of course that's nonsense because it doesn't matter how perfect it is yeah. you've got not got the perspective because what you're trying to do this is what I've discovered anyways is that like there's different parts of your brain that you need in the writing process yes and so the version the part of your brain that writes the first draft is not the part of your brain that edits correct the first draft to correct. create the second draft and it's not the part of your brain that can do the fun uh, the you know the finessing right at the end of the process. So, and I think this applies to lots of different um, forms of creativity. So like, for example, you know, as a sculptor, they wouldn't put a block of clay onto the plinth and then start just working on the nose or the eyebrows. They get the general shape of the face and then the shape of the nose and the eyebrow. And and then they start to refine and then really get into the detail of the hair. Yeah, yeah. Oh, hi puppy. Oh, hello. Welcome, welcome to the other guest. <laughs> this is Maisie. Yeah. And Maisie has a story too. And Maisie's going to go back <laughs> into her little hidey hole. Bless. All right, Puppy. Go on. You did so well. And, and you'll make it on just for that five seconds. Yeah, that was your, that was your moment of fame. <laughs> <laughs> that is it. That's the big moment there. You've done it. Like, I can juggle, Mummy. <laughs> um. So, yeah, so I feel like you have to go, you have to let 
you go of sculptor. trying to yeah let, you, you have to let go of trying to do all those different processes yes. all at once because that's what I was trying to do yeah. I was trying to do broad strokes mid strokes and fine yeah. strokes all with one brush <laughs> that's so interesting because I guess that tells us about your personality but also a lot of people's personality which is I, I I'm expected to be this perfect individual Mm. and if I can't hit that then you're going to see this is what we were speaking about earlier Mm. you're going to see I'm not very good at this Mm. and no one expects you to get that first draft perfect that's the whole point of first second third isn't Mm. it yeah is that it's a process Mm -hmm. and no one has to have all the answers straight away and that's in anything Mm -hmm. sports Mm -hmm. even I guess even engineering you know you're so you're so right actually because I'm just imagining if someone was learning say to run the 100 meters because 100 meters isn't just running as fast as you can there's a real technique to it yeah and so their first attempt is their first draft yeah it is yeah and then they get some training and some coaching and they do a bit of like yeah you know practice of those things do some drills and that's what puts people off and I know for you, for me, for anyone. Anytime I do something for the first time, which is why I'm honest about my book, mm-hmm. I'm not saying it's rubbish because it's not, mm-hmm. but I did put a lot into it. Mm-hmm. A little bit of my story, mm-hmm. a little bit of explanation about what that means for the people reading the story. Mm-hmm. Then the sections of how you would fix, not fix, how you would heal mm-hmm. yourself with a similar story mm-hmm. and then information about that information. Mm-hmm. There's a hell of a lot in there. Mm-hmm. It's quite a hard read for that reason, I think. Mm-hmm. But if I hadn't have done that, I wouldn't have learnt that. Mm-hmm. And I wouldn't ever be thinking... And, and also, I wasn't... I guess the thing is about you as well, and, and, and also about me, is I'm not scared to put it out there. I, I am scared to put it out there, but it won't stop me putting it out there. Yes. Even yeah. if it's not perfect. Mm-hmm. I want it to be perfect. and I've gone through a similar process to you. I've got to have this perfect. But I'm going to put it out anyway. Mm. And that's the only... It's, you spoke about the growth earlier. About and, and I mentioned the the tearing the muscles. You've got to tear the muscles with mm. every project or every career decision you make. Yeah. You've got to tear the muscles. It's going to hurt, but then you come back with more knowledge and you come back with more strength. There's always going to be something you're not going to like about something yeah. you've created as well. Yeah. There will always be that because you're not the person who finishes the book is not the person who started it. It's so true. And yeah. the person who publishes it or yeah. you know is promoting it when it's published is not the same yeah, person you're right. you know? so so of course there's going to be things that you're like I, I did a filmmaking course and every um we made like six or seven films over the course short films over the course of this um program and every time we went to make the second one I look back at the first one and go ah oh, why didn't I yes and it all oh, you're learning you're all in the a... time yeah but if people the reason I bring that up is because I reckon everyone's got the ability to write a book Mm. but most people wouldn't do it because someone said this to me the other day actually he's a client and he said something like if I if I write a book I've got to write it all and if I do that basically I'm going to be judged because there's bits of the story that nobody else knows about yet Mm -hmm. and I was like yeah that's true you will be judged and you have to be comfortable with being judged you have to be comfortable with people saying not nice things Mm. you have to be comfortable with people telling you that you're amazing because mm-hmm. that's just as uncomfortable as being judged sometimes, mm-hmm. as in a negative judgment. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because you might not be comfortable with being praised. Mm-hmm. And it is a very uncomfortable thing. But he's not, at, at this moment in time, this may change. He's just not willing to do it. Mm-hmm. And it's that, where you say it is a learning pro Like learning, be it four years old, learning how to, you know, write a story or learning is the most profound experience but it's it's, hard as well it's so hard it's hard and the other thing as well about any uh, of the big creative uh, sort of disciplines that we're familiar with like writing and acting and things like that people say they want them or even learning a language yeah people say they want them but they don't want to go on the journey yeah you're right and uh, I think once people realise what the journey is, there's a lot of natural wastage. You know, yeah. a lot of people fall by the wayside yes, they because do. they're just like, oh, I, I don't want this. Like, I remember, I can't remember what book it was in, but it was a, I think it was a Malcolm Gladwell book, perhaps. Mm-hmm. And he was talking about this uh, pianist was playing virtuoso performance or whatever. And this woman said, oh, you know, I would give my life to be able to play like you. And he said, I did. Yeah, you know, and that's that's the thing about a lot of these crafts yes. is that you have to give your life to everything it, really. up. Yeah, you do. You, you're giving your life to yeah. to to that pursuit. And I think 
I mean, I do do that literally. I think I've lost a lot of social life and all that kind of stuff. But there's a, what people realize, don't realise is that when you give that all up, you're gaining so much yeah. as well. It's a choice. There's always a cost. There is. But for the most part, it, it well, it should be a cost that you're willing to pay. Yes. You shouldn't. It shouldn't be a sacrifice or a martyrdom or something. Yes, like, you're right. What I'm giving to for my art. <laughs> but that's a good point because a lot of people do become the martyr. Yeah. And yeah. they become the victim. Yeah. To their own story. Yeah. That they chose. Yeah. So there's a that's lot. That's it. Yeah. yeah. You make that choice. Yeah. And then you are the victim in the story. But why? Yeah. If you don't want this, get a job in yeah. the bank. You yeah. know what I mean? Like Is you, that true? You really don't make this everybody else's fault. Yes. That you're in this. Yeah. <laughs> because it is, I would imagine, for you can be quite an isolating experience mm. i know you surround yourself with other creatives so but for writing a book it, not everyone's writing a book at the same time you are so it is quite an isolating experience i mean i do like being by myself which is a good thing <laughs> yeah I, I really really like being by myself um i like being on set and i like being with other actors and stuff like yeah. that but my happy place really is making up shit yeah <laughs> I love making up stories and actually I had an insight about it in that you know when when stuff happens to you and you build up a sort of defense mechanism when that's healed it can become a superpower yes definitely and so my defense mechanism growing up was fantasy life yeah you know like really vivid fantasy life yeah if I was in this place or if that person was if I wasn't in this family or you know, yeah, do you know what I mean yeah. and I'd just disassociate I'd go off yeah. in these flights of fancy well now that's my job yes you know to make up stories and so the healing process has allowed me to turn what was a defence mechanism into something that and I, it can now be a value to the world rather than a way of keeping it at arm's length see that's very powerful because again I think there's a lot of people in their healing process that still don't see the point of the pain mm. and what you've just said there is there is a point to the pain and you might be able to actually turn it into something very beautiful. Well, that's it. I mean, the, what what comes to mind is um, social workers. I can't, I can't remember the phrase they use to, to sometimes describe themselves. Is it wounded? Wounded, wounded, say, wounded healers or something like something that. Something like that. Yeah. And it is because a lot of them have had... Yeah come from situations where they've been in a difficult family environment or yeah. it's been it's been abusive and so from that they've learned how to support and help other people that are going through the same yes. thing or recognize the signs and yes. things like that so what looked like pointless pain is actually what's helped them to become so empathetic in the role that they yeah. got yeah so it's the same thing it doesn't matter what you've what you've been through it's what just you've how been you in use it. it's how you use it yeah. there, there it there can be some value in it if you're able to transform it into something that can be of service and use to yourself and other people and again it's choices because I think we've all been a victim and we've all been a martyr at some point in our lives Mm -hmm. if there's been pain before you know Mm. and even if there hasn't it's an easy role to slip into because Mm. most of us have experienced pain whether it be in our own family home or being bullied at school or being you know told we're not enough on some level Mm -hmm. you will experience what it's like to be a victim and actually, um, a friend of mine, I don't know where the quote comes from, but he used to say to me all the time, you've got to go through it to grow through it. Ooh, that's nice. And, and I love that because mm. I'll never, ever forget that. And mm. I'm like, every single time something's acutely painful, mm-hmm. just go through it because you're going to grow through it. Yeah, the one that I like is rough seas make good sailors. Yeah, Or calm seas don't make good sailors. That's right. You know, and you think about it, it's like, what do you learn from tranquil waters? Nothing, apart you, from that it's nice. Yeah, it's like, it's nice out, isn't it? <laughs> but yeah, those, those, because I used to sail at school, they used to take us out. And so like, I literally, I, that that means so much to me because I have a visceral like memory of like, yeah. the one time, a, uh, what they call a squall yes. coming in and capsized the boat and we didn't know, but it was a learning curve. It was definitely a you learn a lot from yeah that. we learned a lot um and so i think in life if we have the chance to go through those things i mean i say it like that now because i'm not in it yeah. in those things but like yeah, but you have been so you are you, know, you have the wisdom yeah i mean it's that classic thing of like would you go back and change anything and i can say categorically no yeah um, power there because the thing is as well about things that you grow up in you don't know what skills it's given you as well yeah I, I, I mean 
when people say why me because people do say that especially in therapy you know why me why is this always me and I'm like Mm. have you looked at what am I getting from this rather than why me yeah because there's so much that you're going to gain yeah and they're like well I can't possibly see what that would be right now yeah and then I always use well when you go to the gym and you tear a muscle Uh you know the muscle grows that's exactly the same right that's it one of the best things that ever happened to me was getting made redundant people say that a lot yeah and I and I I couldn't reconcile it at the time I was just like this is some kind of bullshit I remember (laughs) I remember like literally leaving with the box of stuff you know your box of things from your desk and I had (laughs) the next day I remember my boyfriend went to work and I was at home and we had this big uh I don't know what you call what do you call them beanbag yeah in the spare room and I laid down on it and I slept I cried actually first I just cried and then I slept and it was the first time that I'd been at home during the day and I wasn't ill so I wasn't off work ill since I was 16. Wow. That was I think at the time it would have been about sort of 12 13 years of just constantly working if I'm like even when I was at college I was working McDonald's two days a week and you know I was always no rest really no rest at all and so this is the first time that I had nothing nowhere to go they gave me a check and there was Gosh. yeah but there was nowhere to go no nobody to answer to I mean I, I got I figured something out and and actually I think that that incident actually set me on the path towards um acting that because someone a podcast has just gone out again he's an artist he's a painter but he he paints um really predominantly boxers Mm -hmm. and he goes to all the big big fights Mm. and he gets the boxers to sign his words and mike Mm. tyson all the best amazing because las vegas all the biggest ones Mm. but he was made redundant from Mm -hmm. a job that was very purposeful he was looking after well supporting young people who had been in trouble at school Mm -hmm. and it was you know their their road to the future looked like crime and all sorts of things and he was doing a lot of good work there Mm -hmm. got made redundant and ended up going right you know I'm going to chase the dream mm. and he did and he that's how he lives his life and it, in that world he's very he's run he's won awards and everything in oh, that incredible. world to, for, for his contribution to art in the boxing arena his contribution to boxing mm. and he'd done you know he'd been an amateur boxer and wanted to be a professional oh, boxer so he was meeting his nice. heroes but painting them he's yeah. done phenomenally well but he said that as well because you've got to make different choices when when the safety of the salary is taken away mm. and the safety of that construct, that bubble, mm. Mm. you have to now make choices mm. that are going to somehow change the landscape of your life. Mm-hmm. And the choices you make lead on to the next and the next and the next. Or at least you've got the opportunity That's to. That's the opportunity, yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I actually wasn't thinking in that way. I was thinking I need to, I need to be working, right? Yeah. So I, I got, um, I think I started off uh, freelancing just doing a bit of work here and there and then someone said that there was a um, a job as a general manager going at a post-production company so I was like okay applied for that got that job but it was actually through that job that I ended up meeting a producer who hired me to be a post-production supervisor on his show so I ended up leaving there but the reason I mention this is because while I was the post-production supervisor on this show that's when I met a bunch of actors and we were all because we were all on the same site and so I got to know the actors and was able to start having conversations with them about how do you become an actor wow you know so so that's why the redundancy set me on that. It, it was like several steps to get there, but it it, it had was, it not have happened, you would not have got there. Well, that's it, and I and I think of it as this moving away from the desk because yes. I was so desk based. Like the early jobs that I had, like I worked for Disney for a little while, and then I had a little bit more freedom in the general manager job, and then with the post production supervisor role, I was able to move around and I could go down on set, and the, and then I became an actor, no desk. That's that's. <laughs> Again, this is why I love these stories, because everyone's got a similar outcome, mm-hmm. but a different way of getting to that. Yeah, that's it. You know, where it was like, oh, actually, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Mm-hmm. But we don't often go, oh, tell me about the exact steps. That yeah, yeah. Because then when you're tuning into podcasts, I mean, we all listen to them or, or reading about someone's life story. You see these steps and you're like, 
oh gosh, yeah, I shouldn't really take anything for granted. Well, that's it. And also, I think, say that if that's the service, I'm sort of holding my hand up to denote a line, we see a little peak above it, which is yeah. the thing they did on TV, or yes. the amazing artwork that blew up, yes. or the, you know, whatever it is. Underneath is so much yes. mess. Like, it's like chaos, yeah. really, yeah. By, by comparison of all of the, the misfires, the attempts that don't work, yeah. the rejection, yeah. the trying and failing. Yeah. The, oh, I'll try this instead. You know, there's so much below the surface. So it I think when people decide, oh, I want to be a blah, 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 they're just seeing what's above. Yeah, and they, they don't, don't see, see any of the stuff below. You listen to Diary of a CEO. Uh-huh. Have you no. heard Paul Runson's episode on there yet? No, but I shall listen to it. You know who he is? Mm-hmm. He's the guy that does um, celebrity dating on E4. Oh, right. And he also does Married at First Sight. Okay. He's one of the experts, right? Dating experts. Oh. He's an American guy. Uh-huh. I is hope... this the black guy? Yes. Yes, I know, I know who he's you know, about. You know who he yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. I say he's American. He might be... I think he's American. He's, he's American. I, I, I always get... I can never tell a Canadian accent. Oh, he could be Canadian. That's I don't know. Point. I think he's probably Let's American. say he's from North America. He's from that area. <laughs> he tells a story, which I won't spoil for everybody if you haven't watched it. But it's about the process. Uh huh. And I'll just give insight a little tiny bit. He sets up a little um, show on YouTube, uh-huh. puts thousands of pounds into it, <gasps> hardly gets any viewers. Uh huh. And then one major person in the world, for some reason, because knew someone he knew, happens to watch it. Oh my god! And it changed his life. I love stuff like that. And it, and he basically says, I'm paraphrasing, but it only takes that one person to see it. Mm. So when you're doing something. And it's what you were saying. You see this bit with Paul Ransom. He's on national TV Mm. and he's doing really well for himself. You see that bit. Underneath, there was all this money, all this time. Mm -hmm. It was determined. And then this one special person watches his channel Mm. and invites him to do something. But also, this is again another example of that preparation Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. timing. That's a perfect example. Yeah. And when you hear the story... Um, it, I think he only tells it for maybe 10 minutes of the actual show. Mm-hmm. But you'll be like... <gasps> and, and it hit me because my YouTube channel, I've not made any effort with. Mm-hmm. So if you say, oh, yeah, I did this podcast and you can watch it here, or you can listen to it there. Mm-hmm. I always direct people to Spotify. Mm-hmm. Um, because when I started, that was the, the producer that I was using at the time. That was the one he was really focused on. Okay, yeah. Because I think in terms of trying to get sponsorship and all those mm-hmm. sort of things, they like to see the downloads. Ah, okay. Whereas YouTube has got its own thing. Like, you can monetize on YouTube after sure. a certain amount of subscribers. So I've hit just over the 1,000 subscriber mark, which I was a little bit disappointed with because I've got 100,000 on Instagram and I just was mm-hmm. like... I assume that you're all just going to go over <laughs> yeah. there because you're so desperate to see more. Guys, 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 I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Yeah, sure, we'll see you there, Anna. That did not happen. Yeah, yeah. So I was focusing on Spotify, which is doing really well. Great. YouTube, though, mm. I just haven't pushed it. Mm-hmm. And because it's changed so much, mm. it's all about short form now, not mm-hmm. long form. Mm-hmm. So that's got to be something that I employ somebody to do for me to mm-hmm. get the YouTube anywhere. Mm-hmm. But I say that because I still put it out there every single time. Mm-hmm. So those that want to watch it can. Mm-hmm. Um, and you just go, oh, it's got, you know, maybe a thousand views or something on some of them. And mm-hmm. lots of, and then you go, oh, is it really worth it? Because I've got to employ somebody to do this for me. And mm-hmm. it's more money, more time, yeah, more effort. Yeah. And then you realise with Paul Runson's story. And when you know, when you find out who the person that viewed it was, you'll be like, wow. Oh, my gosh. You only need that one person. Yeah. That's and true. it doesn't have to be this person. When you hear this person, you'll know. Mm-mm. I'm really just pushing everybody on to <laughs> Stephen Bartlett's podcast yeah, right now. Yeah, yeah. Stay on this one. <laughs> Why am I doing free advertising for I Stephen know, right? Bartlett? He does not need it. But I want everyone to hear that story mm. because a lot of what you've said is tied into this 10-minute segment of what he says. And it's, oh, okay. It just goes, bang. Yeah. But you were saying about this, un, you know, this curve underneath. Mm. Years and years and years mm-hmm. for you mm-hmm. of trying different things, investing your money, mm-hmm. investing your time, taking risks. And now you're doing the stuff where you say, I like being on my own. So the writing mm. is really good. Mm-hmm. But the acting, which is where you 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 start your story with, I just didn't think, it didn't even occur to me that that would ever mm. be me. Mm. And now it is you. Mm. And you've done so much to get there. But off the back of quite a, an interesting story as well, which is how you viewed yourself within the world as a result of those beginnings. Mm, yeah. And when we first started recording, I think you said, well, just before we started, mm-hmm. I think you said something like, my childhood's not that interesting. <laughs> but actually, the story behind who you are 
is really interesting because I don't think we'd be sitting here talking about this without the abandonment issue, without, sure. you know, the criticism mm -hmm. from your mum. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would be, you'd be in a totally different universe. I don't think it, this would be your world. Yeah, I think that's true. And actually, the what I considered to be challenges yeah. have probably put a fire up me. The, yes. I'd rather have a fire up me and then have to go to therapy to sort out some of the toxicity yeah, yeah, yeah. rather than have not had it and be have had a mediocre yeah. kind of experience of life. Because they do say that if you give your child too much of an easy run. Mm. I made a comment on somebody else's podcast and I said um, something along the lines of... Um, I think we shouldn't make it too easy for our kids. They need to learn the hard way. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, not with everything. Mm -hmm. And that's that tearing the muscle, mm. feeling the pain and then yeah. seeing the growth. There's definitely, I think with, with parent, parenting, and I don't have kids, but I think there is a, a constant challenge, a tension between um, safety and freedom yes. of like, are you going to send them out into the world and find out the hard way? Yeah. Um, but how, how can you keep them safe yeah. in that process? And even from, from when they're born, learning to walk, like, yeah. okay, no, we're not going to walk near that because that's yeah. got sharp corners and all the yeah. rest of it, to, to when they get into, like, choosing university or yes. whatever. And then beyond, it's just this constant tension between letting true. them find out the hard way, yeah. as in give them their freedom, and keeping them safe. Yeah. The one thing that I'll say about that, and this is interesting actually, is when I used to take my daughter to the park and see all the kids climbing on the climbing frame, you'd see kids that were just really good at climbing. And I used to stand there and think, there's no way I'm letting mine do that. Because mm -hmm. if she falls from the top, that's it. That mm. should be a goner. Mm. And other kids would just do it. And their mm -hmm. parents were like, oh, yeah, she's such a good climber. And I would literally be going, yeah, but what if? Yeah, yeah. And so I realised that anything that I had a fear of, uh -huh. I was projecting right yeah, and yeah. so it's about telling the whole story which is okay so i'm worried about this but i recognize that it's my fear <sighs> yeah and so what we need to do is talk about it and and the rule that i give to my daughter which has worked 99.9% .9 of the time is you will never be in trouble if you tell me the truth mm. whatever the truth is whatever it is you want to do mm. wherever it is you want to go you'll never ever get into trouble mm. the only reason that this fails is if you lie because that's where the punishment comes in mm -hmm. so you get grounded or whatever mm. and I feel like with that the communication that you get with your child even mm. if I mean, don't get me wrong teenagers never really want to be friends with their parents mm. but the communication is I can trust you that I can ask you for this mm. and I can trust you that if I'm honest nine times out of ten you're going to say yes unless there's a really profound reason that you should say no mm, yeah. and so then you're saying okay you go off and and we've had this conversation could be about drugs alcohol sex whatever we've had this conversation I have to trust you because if I don't mm. you're going to do it anyway in a really unsafe way mm, but also know it. that this is because you've told me the truth you're always safe with me mm. you can always come home there's never you're never going to be punished or judged mm. I say never and Sometimes we unconsciously judge and they feel that. Mm. But the intention is not to judge. Mm. And I It's really impressive, though, to, to just to go back to what you said about, um, you know, acknowledging your own fear yeah. and, and projecting it onto your... Yeah. I don't think a lot of parents do that. Yeah. And it's that's grown work, like, yeah, to be able hard. to recognise that in yourself and yeah. then just sort of, like... Own it. Because it's cutting the, the sort of generational sort of part ties yeah, and it passing is. that on. Because otherwise that's what will happen, isn't yeah, it? It, is. so like it just gets passed on. It gets on. passed on. And I, I guess I just was really aware of my own self and that I was always a bit, but I'm going to do it anyway. Mm. So you're either going to support me or you're not. And people didn't support me. Mm. So I did it the really hard way. Mm -hmm. And it actually was to my detriment. So I would like to be able to give the experience of you're going to gain some resilience, but you're safe to do that because I'm going to be there. I think resilience is important as well. Talking more generally now, but I do feel like as much as it's great that mental health is in the forefront, yeah. you know, I, I, I think that the value of resilience. Yes. Which is, you know, when you're talking about when trauma happens, like so what are some of the things you can. Yes. The, good things that you can take from it and resilience might be one of them yeah but we're not really instilling that in our young no, people not. I don't think we're not as much as we could and so we're now in this environment where say for example someone is triggered by something but doesn't realize that that if they had resilience and they would be able to navigate it without making it everybody else's it's problem so true and what parents are going to struggle with now is they have got 
information about the world in the palm of their hands mm. in a way that we never had. No, we knew nothing. We knew <laughs> nothing. <laughs> we would find out in other ways, but we knew no. You get near. yourself to the Britannica yes. Encyclopedia. <laughs> <laughs> and you will spend hours down there yeah. because it's tiny, tiny writing. <laughs> That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but they've got everything. Yeah good and bad mm. and so if you're not having that open conversation with your child mm. and owning it mm-hmm. then they're going to find out from their friend who's say, say 13 who's got a brother who's oh, 18 yeah who's already been there for five years and done everything and seen everything that they should not see mm. so their education is coming from the wrong place so letting them express what they want mm. owning your own fears and having a real you know that that doesn't mean they're not going to come to you and say right I want to do this you're not going to agree with it but I'm really really desperate Mm, to do it mm, mm, so then you're about like how do I facilitate this safely mm, within a boundary mm, and most kids will accept that as long as they feel heard mm -hmm. and as long as they feel seen mm, but if you're not going to do that they're going to get it from TikTok or from their friend's brother or whoever it is so they're going to get not they're not going to get resilience. They're going to traum- they're going to be traumatized. Mm. So it's the parent to facilitate the resilience process. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I really think for you personally that you've got so much to offer in terms of what what you've gone through and what that means for the people listening, because they they might not be having these conversations with their parents or even with their friends. Right? Yeah. 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 So yeah. your story is really powerful in that way. And I do think people will listen and they'll be inspired by it. Mm, oh, well, I hope so. Especially the bit, to be fair, where you just got to a certain age and you didn't consider your age to be a, a block. No, I mean, again, I think that is something that I might have inherited because yeah. my mum, like, she's 80, she's literally just published her memoirs. Like, her, like she wrote amazing. her life story. Yeah, she just went for it. And, and, and <laughs> there is a sort of, how hard can it be kind of yes. uh, attitude that sort of goes down the sort of Osho women, yeah. you know, bloodline, I think. And so she just started and then I got involved. I helped her with some editing and stuff. And, you know, long story short, we, you know, it came out a few months ago, well, last month, actually. Um, That's really incredible. Yeah, she's, I mean, she's done brilliantly and she was, she was on Woman's Hour um, the day that it came out. That and, is so impressive. Yeah, she, and she's like, handling it like a pro. She's just, even though she's never done any of the sort of media and stuff like that, she's just like jumped straight in. She she leads um, church services, so she right. has done some public speaking. Yeah. But it's kind of a different order when you know like millions of people are, are tuning yes. in or something. So, so yeah. it's just in the DNA. Well, I mean, I think there's definitely some spirit in our family of just like, just give it a try, man. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's not to say that I go into anything fearlessly. I I actually think fearlessness is not real. I don't, I I think when people say, I'm just not scared of anything. Disassociated. I just, yeah, I just think, really, you're not scared of anything or you're just not aware of the things that you're scared of, you know? Yeah, maybe that. This is not the same thing. And actually... Fear is, um, you know, a really important safety mechanism. We need it. it. Yeah, in human psyche. It's just we don't need to buy into it every time. Yes. You know, when the th- when the threat is existential, then maybe you're, you're yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. It's measuring it, isn't it? And exactly. And having that conversation with yourself. Yes. So I don't go into things fearlessly. I'm scared often and I worried about the the you know the consequences or yeah. like now what have I got myself involved with yeah. or am I gonna get exposed as not knowing what I'm doing or whatever yeah. but I, it never stops me that's never the deciding factor of whether I'm gonna go and do something or not I'll do it and yeah. if it's awkward and embarrassing or if I make a mistake or a misstep then so be it that'll be that'll be my learning and just to go back something else I was going to add as well is that in terms of because when you were talking about your book and what you would want to change about it I do think there's something in like the product there being byproducts of your learning process yes and so sometimes I relate to some of the things that I've created that aren't so great yeah as just a byproduct of my learning do you know what that's I mean that's so important to yeah it that way. that's that's sort of stuff that just got created out of me trying to figure out how to write a book or yes. figure out how to make a short film the next one can be it and if not then that can be a byproduct too but that's good because it's it's always about having the intention to to grow and to be 
better than you were before. Yeah. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's not saying it wasn't enough. Mm. It's saying that I've got more in me. Imagine if I could do that, but yeah. better. Or yeah. do something yeah. that, but different. Or And 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 through that, I grow and learn yes. as a creative. Anyways, I mean, like my books, the first one, I just didn't know what I was doing. Second one, I understood structure and character more and... I think I had a more solid idea. Yeah. And everything I've learned from both those books, I'm now taking into the third one. Yeah. So, and I am and I changed the perspective that I wrote the second one in because I wanted to give myself a, a, a challenge because everything was written in the third person in the first one. So I make it first person in I the love second that. one. This new one is now it's got like love scenes in it and crime and stuff like that. So again, I'm, I'm yeah. I've ne- I've never and nothing I've written has required me to do so much research as this particular book. So that's a new challenge that I've given myself and another way in which I grow and add to my toolkit. You know, the it's bigger so your toolkit, good. the better you can be at your craft. I'm so impressed by it because what I'm hearing is someone that started off with no awareness of of really being part of that creative scene, but being more behind the scenes with it, mm-hmm. who's now gone through the stand-up thing, <laughs> is still an actor, mm-hmm. but really, um, I because you didn't take the standard route of drama school, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, mm-hmm. but your journey to get there has been so much more flavoursome. <laughs> yes, I was going to say colourful. Yes, <laughs> yeah, but you're right. yeah, yeah, it yeah. has. Yeah. So it gives so much more to those people that perhaps maybe what they consider to be, oh, I've wasted that opportunity, I should have gone to drama school or I should have done this or I should have... Mm. To go, actually, listening to that, like, that's inspired me just to keep going. It's definitely been a rich experience. And actually, I I was listening to an Abraham Hicks uh, talk and she was saying, you know, it's so funny (laughs) in the way she does. It's so funny. Uh, (laughs) um, And she was saying that humans assume that the progress should be linear. Yeah. We've, that's right. We've made this assumption. Yeah. I'm here. I want to get there. Yeah. Take me straight to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where's the bridge? And yeah, exactly. Cross. But actually, sometimes the universe might want to show you some stuff. Yeah, absolutely. You know, or it might want to give you some skills yeah. or make you have the resilience to be able to sustain when you get there. Yeah. Imagine if you went on a frictionless path to that point. Imagine what skills you might miss out on getting. And also, it's it's like any good story. It's pretty boring if it's just so, I wanted to meet this guy, I went to a club, we met, we went, we stayed together ever since. Well, imagine if, if like, Neo became the one, like, really easily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) If he didn't have to, like, follow any white rabbit or fight, have any martial arts training. What if he just, what if he was already a taekwondo and karate and drunk fighting master? The Matrix would be a really boring film. You're right. I just don't think it would have done as well as it had. No, I think you're right. Every story needs the twists and the turns, the ups and the downs. That's because we know, for the most part, when we're watching stories, reading books, watching a movie or a TV show we know how it's more movies actually because they're sort of finite we know how they're going to end yeah the joy of watching them is not getting to the end it's the journey yes you are you're so right and actually that has been your story it has been a journey mm. from the bits even at the beginning which I don't think you consider to be too interesting the childhood stuff I think it's all been really interesting and actually I like listening to these stories especially when I'm present with the person because I learn so much about myself, mm-hmm. even though some of it I already know, of course, because I sit with people all day long. Sure, yeah, yeah. But each story brings you new lessons. Yeah, I guess so. And and I've this is why I feel like I've discovered podcasts because I'm like, guys, do you know about this? I know. There's actually podcasts where people just have really in depth conversations. <laughs> but I've only just started listening to them. That's why I feel a bit sort of like it's a revelation. But like. <laughs> I, the ones that I've been listening to, yours included, I've just been like having the same experience. It's yeah. just like through l- hearing somebody's story, either I learn something new about life, about myself, or have something validated about something that I was sort of, yeah. sort of thinking about, yeah. but didn't have the language for, but that person's like articulated it yeah. really well. So it's so interesting hearing people's like life stories and experience. It is, especially because I think, we get lost, we are all self-absorbed and we get lost in Mm. ourselves and we forget there's lots of reflections out there. Mm. And if there's lots of reflections of us now, then there's lots of reflections of us in the future as well. So look to people for that inspiration. It doesn't Mm. have to be someone mega famous. It can be someone that you come across 
on a podcast that's yeah. got a story that resonates with you. And it might be, I'm not saying it's the only thing that will contribute to the changes that you make, but it could be like that final thing that you mm. go, do you know what? Yes, I'm going to go to therapy or I'm going to go to that little yeah. workshop. 100%. It, I've had that so many times from just like things like, even like I, I listen to, um, I'm not going to name it, but the Steve. Right, because we're promoting him again. I know, right? <laughs> but he had a couple of financial uh, whizzes on. Yeah, and so at the moment, I'm really looking at having an uh, an audit for myself. Yeah, I think that's really that's something that I'm sort of doing generally. Is just like I, I don't think we bring enough consciousness to yes. our lives in terms of just planning. Yeah, not even about getting to know yourself or you know any kind of growth or whatever, but just like. Where's everything at? Yeah. Where am I at financially? Where am yeah. I at emotionally? Yeah. Do, uh, what am I doing with my work? Or it's so true. Do you know what I mean? Like we we just don't have a habit of doing that. We're kind of we we get into the habit of winging it. Yeah, rather I than certainly do. Consciously sitting down and going. I just the other day, and it's because I don't think that he specifically said this, but because I was listening to this financial guy, I just went through every single month for the next year to figure out how much I reckon I might earn, how much I'll have, how much I'll end up paying out. Yeah. And know what will, and project what will be in my bank at the end of the year, at the end of that 12 months. I've never done that before. See that, see that is interesting. And, And I'll tell you why, because just about a week ago, I downloaded an app which is an AI app, mm-hmm. which is a planner app. Mm-hmm. So it's a bit like an AI assistant. So I've got a real life assistant. She does loads for me. She's amazing. Mm-hmm. But it was the stuff like make a phone call to the roofer, you mm-hmm. know, or it could be something like call the dog groomers. Mm-hmm. They were the things that need to get done, mm-hmm. but I was never penciling them in because they uh, seemed insignificant. Yeah, so they've never, they they never happened. Get, yeah, yeah, so you end up with this pile, this list, because mm-hmm. I, I am a list person for my clients but for myself I wasn't doing that mm-hmm. so I downloaded it's it like 20 quid or something like that I won't say the name because I'm not sure if I'm allowed to mm-hmm. but um it, it, you just put everything in that you know you want to do and it it shuffles it basically organizes your life uh, that's with really good what it knows you already have to do yeah yeah and on, on one of my podcasts someone said this to me once and he said when people say they haven't got time they mean the time between this time and that time. They don't look at the 24 hours in the clock. That's it. You know, segment what you, the time you use to sleep and eat, mm-hmm. the time you have to work. And then you've got more hours left than you realise. It's how you're using those hours. 100%. It's the same with money. It's exactly the mm. same with money. I've got to pay this. I've got to pay that. This is what I know I've got. This is what's left. How am I using that? Because mm. you could be buying three coffees a week, which is costing you fifteen pounds. People a week. often don't want to know the reality of it. That's they want to. They want to live in the um, sort of fuzzy fiction, yes. rather than actually the sharp reality yeah, of actually you are spending twenty five quid a week on coffees, yeah, or you are not saving anything, yeah, because <laughs> yeah. you take it out the following month yes. or something like. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, I mean, in terms of time, I mean, time and money are intertwined. Yeah, they right? are. I when I'm trying to achieve something specifically, I've got a project in mind. I will literally schedule my day, not to the, to the minute, but yeah. to the half hour. Yeah. So because what that means is that I hit my goals every day, yes. rather than at the end of the week or the month going, oh, did I write eight chapters or did I write twenty chapters, yes. or whatever it is. I know because I know I wrote that chapter that day and then I know the next day I wrote that chapter and I'll schedule breaks. I'll literally do, I know how long my concentration is. It's about 90 minutes. Yeah. So I have a 90 minute session. Then I have a break, play with the dog. You know, she's a bit bored. So she needs some attention. Then I'll go back in. Then I'll have lunch, play with the dog, you know. I have I I set time for admin yeah. and then in my diary I have a list work admin and personal admin and any of that call the roofer all that yeah. sort of stuff it goes in the diary because otherwise like you say it doesn't happen yeah so then I and if I can't do it I move it into the next day so it never gets so forgotten true. you have to do these things because otherwise because people say to me they go gosh you're so busy and you you do so much and I'm like I this this listen I'm not going to disavow you of that lie, but it's not true. Yeah. What I do is I focus on this one thing, yeah. do it to the best of my ability, and then I'll move on. And I'm constantly saying, I'm not doing that, I'm not doing that, I'm not doing that, because yeah. it doesn't have anything to do yeah. with the overall yeah. goal. Do you yeah. know what I mean? And I'm super efficient with my I time. admire that so much. Hence the reason, you know, I've got the AI person, mm-hmm. person the robot, <laughs> yeah, yeah. to do it for me, because 
is such is for me it's such a flawed part of my brain organizing and getting but if that you can structure. find a tool that works for you Correct. and allows you to do that yeah then have at it do you know what i mean i think this is where ai is okay yes yeah, where sure. it concerns me because there's so many aspects of our industry that are going to be where I know. people's work is just going to be dissipated I know, it ai is a can edit it can design yeah. it can draw yeah you, it can design fashion now i've heard a fashion designer talking wow. about ai designs you know, it, there's, there's just it's scary. So much, it's terrifying. And, and, I, and sometimes I just think as I'm writing, what's the point? I actually have moments where I'm just like, well, what's the point? If, do you know if what though? Way I can d- do this. I think even when it's better than it is now, which it will continue to. Yeah. This to is get, the worst that it'll ever be. It's yeah, only going to improve. It will improve. But I still think we will crave, because we know mm. that this is the way the world is going, we will crave the humanness. I really hope that that's what happens. Yeah, We want the truth of the humanity that comes from someone I creating so. something rather than computer generated. I really think that people will go, yeah, I can see that's Will Smith, but this Will Smith, I can feel him more. Yeah, I, I, I think you'll see it and you'll hear it. You go, that is so good, but you won't feel it in the same way. There is something to be said about there's a, there's a truth in that because when you see computer generated faces, yes. you can see that there's a lifelessness yes, you to can. them. You that, can, you know, when you're watching an incredible performance, yeah, that's authentic and so in it that a, a computer couldn't have predicted. Yeah, this, you're right. It's so these responses, true. yeah. So, and even if it gets super, super, super good, I just don't think it will take away. I, I know it won't take away human. I think there'll be people that don't care. And then I think there'll be people that always care. Yeah. And we will always go. We will want the live performances more than ever. Where it might affect. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. yeah that's will, one of the one place where it we'll can't see. really. Yeah. You you will you will never get the feeling of going to a live concert or a play or yeah. a, like a comedy store. Yeah. You'll never get that from having from, robots. Yeah. So where all those people are losing jobs, I think they'll gravitate towards the live industry. I really hope so. I mean, I went to see, a, a, I, was, I go to a lot of theatre, but, you know, went to see um, Sister Act the other day. And oh, wow. I mentioned this because... Is it, that Beverly Night? At Beverly Night, yeah. And it's such a big show and really rousy, very joyful. Yeah. And that was, and it was when I was watching that show that I thought, yeah, AI could Could never. Couldn't touch this. You can't AI Beverly Knight's voice. Do you know what I mean? You just can't do that. And you wouldn't want that. No, you, wouldn't you wouldn't want to know that a computer, this was a computer generated yeah. experience. Cause, cause the reason that I've got goosebumps is because a human, human. being is yeah. doing that. Yeah. Not because of the sound, but the fact that a human being is creating she that sound. She fascinates me. That voice that she has is just so, and she's so down to earth with it as well mm-hmm. again it's all of those different facets to a person yeah the humanness and knowing who yeah because you've got an idea of who beverly knight is and yes. that's what makes going to see her perform. special that's yeah. part of the yeah. part of the experience isn't it whereas if if it was i don't know miming to ai generated yeah. vocals it yeah. wouldn't be the same at all well even if you look at the old shows of top of the pops where they used to have to mime mm-hmm. they were forced to mime mm-hmm. i can't remember who it was it was it the happy mondays or the stone roses one of the two mm-hmm. and they came on and they were like we're not doing this so i think it might i can't remember which of the bands this is awful of me but one of them stood there and just refused to sing <laughs> right because they were like what's the point <laughs> right because they yeah. were being forced to mime so they just weren't going to do it because they were obviously very real yeah yeah and th- th- that's what it will become yeah I think we'll see more of that like no i'm refusing i want the human i yeah. want that experience yeah. i mean it is down to audiences because as soon as audiences start to consume ai generated content yeah there will be more made. Yeah, there will. So, we're, yeah, so if, if audiences reject it, yeah, then we might be in with a fighting chance of actually still being able to create it. But so many jobs are dependent on an actor being in front of a camera. Yes, yeah, This is right. the problem because yeah. as soon as you don't need, a, you know, you, you can computer generate even yeah. a, a crowd scene, you don't need the costumes, yeah, you don't right. need the makeup people, you yeah. don't need sound, you don't need sets probably. Yeah. You know, that's that's a whole bunch of people that don't get employed because there is not an actor in front of the camera. So it's a huge, huge concern. It is a huge concern for the whole creative industry. For the industry. whole creative industry, yeah. What a shame and what a horrible way to end. <laughs> 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 we're all doomed <laughs> we well and on a... that bombshell <laughs> forget about enjoying this creative yeah, stuff yeah. it's all going to shit that's exactly it <laughs> you heard it here first folks <laughs>
can you imagine? <laughs> At least right, you're so, going to be writing. Well, listen, we, we were going to keep it real, right? So yeah, yeah. That's, that's the reality. So that's the it. reality. I do have like a, what's the point? But then I carry on because I love it. And I think if I was going to leave a parting message, it would be just that, uh, it sounds trite, but to do, to do what you love, but it's like, doesn't mean leaving your job or anything like that, but just do what brings you joy. The last podcast that went out, which, you know, there might be one or two before yours, who knows? Mm -hmm. So the one that's out at the minute with Patrick Killian, he refers to a Jim Ron quote, Mm -hmm. which is work full time at your job and work part time at your dream. I think we said it the wrong way around, but it's something along those lines. Uh So never give up on the dream. Even if you are working, you know, 80 hours a a week, Mm -hmm. if your dream is to be a poet, you know, every day, mm-hmm. give yourself five minutes to write some of the poem mm-hmm. and just keep it going. Keep the little candle burning mm. and then build on that. Yeah. There's always space for the dream, I think. And that's what you're saying is like, just keep it. And with whatever happens with technology, mm. I know human beings. And as we are right now in 2024, I think people will start to say, look, let's use the AI to help us here, but not to replace. Mm. Now, I'm not saying there won't be industries that do do that. But there are people that believe it's the American dream. It's such a big thing. But people want the dream. People want the process. They want the journey. Mm-hmm. And those that don't, that cheat, mm. will leave them to it. Mm. I think the rest of us will still crave that. I think that's really heartening, the idea that people will, yeah, just long for the human experience yeah. of, of what some of what a person has created yeah. like artistically yeah. rather than, you know, the the cheat codes for yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> Because they will, you know, we, we still talk about Elvis Presley, the Beatles, you know, Bob Dylan. We People talk- want to use AI to recreate them, like the ABBA experience yeah. and stuff, which I suppose, I suppose the thing is there's um there's a, a, an appropriate space for that. Yes, that's what the point is. But that it doesn't become everything. It doesn't exactly. become the only thing that you exactly. can see live. And I think that's what will happen. I think it will be there, but I think we'll also Alongside. Yes. Yeah. I, I think also there's probably some value in going back to like smaller stuff absolutely smaller venues definitely and like because I, I really want to get into I've wanted to get into watching live music for a really long time yeah. but everyone that I think is cool is already massive, massive do you know what yeah. I mean like, I'm not going to see Beyonce I'm just no, it's not going to do you're never going to get the full experience she'll be like that big yeah I agree with and that and so it's like what do you do you go to smaller venues yeah where there's just jobbing musicians yeah and still really super talented people yes. that just haven't you know yeah I mean I remember seeing John Legend before John Legend was massive <gasps> wow Brixton Academy wow and it was phenomenal same with Lenny Kravitz I mean he was massive by that point wow pretty much in the front row got uh-huh. crushed but <laughs> it's brilliant yeah, yeah you know to see these people at the not Lenny but it's certainly John Legend at the beginning of his career in this tiny little venue before anyone really knew yes. who he was. And he was brilliant. And so there is so much value in going to the smaller places. Yeah, yeah. Although Brixton isn't tiny, obviously, but... But it's smaller than he would play yeah, nowadays, yeah, it is, no yeah, doubt. So, yeah. yeah, and I think you do get a completely different experience. When yeah. I've gone to the bit, I saw Whitney Houston once, and I've got to say this, because God love her, and I really do mm. love her. But I saw her in NEC, mm-hmm. and... I just, it was like listening to it because she's such a great singer. Yeah. And she sings per- or sang perfectly. It was literally like putting on a CD. Yeah. And hearing it a bit louder yeah. with people that loved her. Yeah. But she was, like you say, about that big. Yeah, yeah. Had I have seen her in somewhere like Brixton, it would have been a totally different experience. Conversely, I was at a charity thing and Shaka Khan was uh, their closing act. And she was there wow and my god this woman's voice and it's so effortless it looks yeah. effortless obviously this yes. 50 years or whatever yes. of like training and honing or whatever but it was I, I was just like this is wild like just to be that close, close. Her, just like and because because she's been singing those songs for so long picking out a new melody was just so easy oh, and so she wow. transforming this song probably in front of us wow you know what I mean it was it was incredible so I do definitely think those more intimate I mean, sure. I'm not saying go to charity events on the off chance that some sort yeah. of global superstar is there. But what I'm <laughs> saying is... Fingers crossed. You know, you never know. <laughs> but yeah, just you know, for seeking out those smaller spaces. Yeah. Because also in the comedy landscape, those... Um, in fact, in all landscapes, it's grassroots. That's where grassroots people get to learn is. their craft. 
So going and supporting those yeah. smaller venues supports the venues, keeps them in play yeah. and allows people to hone their craft in play in 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 spaces and in ways that don't mean that they're exposed to more than they're ready for. Yeah, so, so they really won't feel important. like a failure then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's organic, isn't it? Yeah, totally, totally. Well, I I know that there's so much good stuff in this episode and I know anyone Fuck. that's listened to it, it doesn't matter what field you're in, they're going to they're going to hear something that resonates. I have. Oh. I've had loads of moments myself today where I've been like, especially around the thing about deserving it and all that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. There's just some real eye openers. Oh, cool. That's great. Thank you so much for doing it. Well, thank you. No, thank you. Oh, listen, let's... <laughs> Later that same evening. No. Thank you. Uh, can we stop now? No, one more. Thank you. No, but really. Uh, thank you. What a way. One more. Thank you. Uh, I thought, I thought, <laughs> people are just going to be like those two were drinking <laughs> yeah exactly they had to be yeah 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 <laughs> honestly honestly that was the best cool that was the, the best oh good I laughed so much thank you so oh, much oh good fun I mean I hope it's a good balance